special judges uh, are Atul Kapoor and Dr. Martinez, Deanna, Paolo. If you guys will take 30 seconds and introduce yourselves, that would be great. All right, I'll go first. Hey, uh, Dr. John Martinez, uh, college classmate of Alex's, so we go way back, um, out in uh, Northern California, Sacramento area, and part of the uh, co-chair of our regional digital health, uh, digital innovations committee, and excited to be judging. Great having you, Marty. Hi, I'm Deanna. Um, I am, I own a recruiting firm that works with health tech, um, primarily working with startups, helping them um, with their pitches. Uh, I've been a mentor for Alex's group for the last couple of years, and I am helping him with MedStarter Direct and selling PPE to hospitals, states, and government. Um, so thanks for having me here. Thanks, Deanna. Always great to have you. Pamela, I, I know I told you not to talk so much, but you know, please tell us who you are. 30 seconds. Okay. My name is Pamela Grace. My claim to fame is in 1975 as an intern, I wrote the first audio video response system for a bank. Since then, I specialized in hardware and software de design for medical products, including design of the first CT scanner, which was a, uh, a scanner for analyzing the, uh, the skin of Saturn V rocket engines. Right now, I run around and I enter in medical device competitions, and my, my biggest one was uh, one that I won at MIT. How's that? Okay. And also, I see Pamela, too, as a, not just an engineer, but also a patient activist who understands healthcare from the perspective. I mean, we're all patients, but some of us who have more chronic conditions like me, you know, uh, are, are, have a deeper understanding of, you know, how the system works and, and are not unwilling to share their opinions on it. <laughs> so, so Pamela and I are members of the walking gallery, you know, and we have these, you know, so we're patient activists, you know, um, and we do crazy things, but, um, you know, people listen sometimes and it helps. And I'm a COVID-19 survivor. Uh, I hopefully. A plasma do. donator. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for everything you do, Pam. Who else we got here today? So yeah, doctors, patients, uh, mentors. Uh, Aline, you want to say what you're up to? Hi, I'm Aline. Um, I'm a digital health connector. So I connect the dots between the different actors in the healthcare ecosystem. I work a lot with startups, helping them to grow, connect with potential clients, investors. And I'm based in uh, Barcelona, Spain. Uh, Paulo, you want to tell everybody who you are? Hello, everyone. Paulo Machado. Been in and around the digital health space for well over a decade. Helped start up the March to figure out how to do product design development. Paulo, your, your mic is messed up. Oh. Okay. I'm not sure I can <coughs> That's what I got. That's much better. Any better? Yes, it's better. Okay, great. Been in and around the digital health space for over a decade, helped startups and large companies, product design, development, commercialization, worked with Alex for over a decade. And also a walking gallery member. Yes. So incidentally, walking gallery are these jackets like this. This was my fair care jacket for my fourth startup, painted by Regina Holiday. This is my, my third jacket for MedStarter Ventures, the venture fund that we started. And yes, I guess that's supposed to be me, but... Yes. You know, you really can't control what Regina paints. But anyway, so in the fifth anniversary of starting MedStarter, she painted me an extra jacket. Uh, so anyway, uh, for us opening a venture fund. So I don't think there's anybody else who has three jackets, but then again, not too many people had their jackets thrown out by an angry person. Um, anyway, so Betty, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> Notice what I'm not saying this week. I'm still digesting that. Okay, so I'm Betty Cosgrove. I'm a former researcher, a molecular biologist, um, did years of business development and sales for research tools, and currently working as a venture coach for ABCT, which is in Connecticut. But I live in New York. Great. Uh, 
Do we have any other judges with us this afternoon? Uh, Ivy Cohen, I'll jump in. Uh, hey. Wait, does someone else? Um, this is Ivy Cohen. Uh, I have a firm, Ivy Cohen Corporate Communications. Most of our clients are Big Pharma, Med Tech, uh, Point of Care, and other health related uh, companies. And I personally and my team have served as mentors to several health startups and uh, incubators in New York City for the past uh, dozen years or so. And uh, excited to hear the uh, offerings today. Awesome. Okay, so Pat, we got every, do we have all the judges? Uh, Andrew uh, knows next oh, oh, Andrew's here, good. I'm sorry, go on. Oh, if you want to talk about me, I, I am a healthcare consultant, mostly in med device, but also pharmacy automation and healthcare IT. And I'm a mentor at Matter in Chicago and um, Smart Health Innovator, which is also in the Chicago area. And that's me. Awesome. Um, Patel uh, also. Atisha Patel, maybe? I might have pronounced that wrong. Atisha with us today? Hi, I'm Atisha. Um, I'm based in Philly um, and have a background in biomedical engineering. Um, and I run a health tech startup called Nodicare. Um, and we bridge a communication gap between the providers and the patient's family members. And one of the things I like about Atisha being here is she's also a biomedical engineer. Um, so a lot of devices and things come through here. So not just health IT, but also, you know, knows how to make stuff. Too. Um, so welcome. Thanks. Uh, did we get everybody? I thought we had uh, Yelini. Okay. So I think that's a pretty good group of judges. Um, so also here is, uh, is Heather, uh, Heather Delaney Artis, who is on our MedStarter team. Uh, she handles uh, investor relations and all sorts of stuff relating to the venture fund. She also is our timer today. So all you teams that are pitching, Heather, say hi. Heather? Heather? Yeah. <laughs> hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> My internet connection is bad. That's not a good thing. Um, so how, how are you going to inform people that they have 30 seconds left and no time left? Let's get a demonstration. It's my internet. Ooh, do that again. I'm going to ring the bell. That's terrible. Do it again. <laughs> okay. You got to do things that are less disruptive. Um, anyway, so, uh, so don't be surprised when you hear Heather say 30 seconds left or ringing that bell, um, you know, to get your attention uh, and don't let it phase you too much. So for those of you who haven't done your tech check, um, Pat will be putting your slides up. You get three minutes to talk. We will stop you at three minutes. And, um, and then you'll have three minutes for Q&A from the judges and the audience. Um, now judges, just so you know, I'm gonna try not to ask as many questions as I did last week. So I, I count on you guys to pipe up with the questions. Um, and I know you guys have to also fill out the forms and thought to do with three minutes, but uh, but you know, we love having you guys here and your help and I will try to back off and not ask so many questions this week. Um, hopefully everybody has opened up the judging sheet and is ready to go on that. You'll notice at the end of it this week, there's, there's the actual address and sizing and gender and such. So if we can send out t-shirts um, uh, once that I'm clear of COVID, so I'm not sending COVID out in the mail to everybody, um, but, um, but that'll, that'll happen soon. And, um, and I think that's it. Uh, so we got five teams going, we got a break, five more teams, a little panel discussion, and we'll talk about the winner. Should be over in like two hours. So is everybody clear? Is there any questions before we get going? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Oh. All right, so Tal, are you ready? Let's get Tal's, oh, hang on, hang on. Put, put, put that deck up back for a second again. I, there's two or three other things uh, that we should probably mention. Um, thanks. Sorry. Um, so go to the next page. Oh, and also when you're advancing, you have to tell Pat to advance. Okay. So the, the big sponsor is MedStart Adventure Partners, a venture fund. These are the judges. MedStart Adventure Fund grew out of a meetup group. We invest with your help. Blah, blah, blah. Next, next. <laughs> go to the, uh, go to the, uh, go to practice slide. I just wanted to talk about our break. Um, this one? Or, yes. Go to practice. So we're doing a fitness break 
uh, instead of a drinking break or a dancing break this week. Um, well, you can still dance or drink, it's up to you. But, uh, but we invited in one of the teams that went through our accelerator a few weeks ago to, uh, to work us out. So we figured we need to be a little healthier um, uh, as well. Uh, also, another one of our judges suggested that we ask uh, folks what they're grateful for uh, in the break. So it might be a good conversation starter. Maybe that's a, that's a panel discussion, uh, Aline. I don't know, it's up to you. So, okay, so that's all I wanted to say from here. So now you can bring up Tal's deck and uh, we can get the show going. Uh, Heather, you ready, timer-wise? Ready. Excellent. Um, so, uh, so we are live streaming this and we're recording this um, on YouTube. Uh, and so you'll also be able to see it on medstarter.tv. There's people probably watching who aren't logged in. You know, every week, uh, hundreds of people watch the videos that we've that we've been posting. So it isn't just a momentary thing. People will be coming in and using this. Also, if you are putting your projects up on medstarter.com, which we hope you all will, um, we can chop up parts of this video for you today. So if you think you did a particularly good job and you want to use this video as part of your crowdfunding video, that's perfectly fine as well. You will um, not get the video today, though. <laughs> oh, no. It'll probably take a couple of days. Um, but Pat, Pat handles that, so you can always get to Pat at Pat at and it'll help you out. Okay, so this is one of the very first ideas that I heard about, um, and I'm really happy that Tao could join us with this with this uh, genius idea um, uh, coming to us today. Um, and it's really one of the reasons that I decided to start doing the COVID uh, challenges, um, just because people were retooling, coming up with. For New York, when you logged in to New York State, I'm Heather, I think you need to turn your mic off. Um, yeah, that, and that's a good reminder. Thanks, Heather, for reminding us all that if you're not uh, speaking and you have background noise, just make sure that you uh, you you know mute yourself. Uh, Pat can mute you as well, um, but um, but you know it's always better if you self monitor because he's got a lot to manage, a lot going on for that young man. Also, just want to say thanks to Pat in particular for doing such a great job. This is our fourth week doing this. And you're just doing a fantastic job. So thank you. Thanks, Alex, appreciate it. And thank you, Heather, and the rest of the MedStarter Direct and MedStarter Venture teams for doing everything else that, so we can focus on this. Um, so, and really, they've been working round the clock on, uh, on MedStarter Direct, which I don't think we've talked about it, but MedStarter Direct is a direct sales force that sells medical innovations and now medical supplies directly into hospitals and uh, cities, states, even FEMA. Um, whether it's masks or gloves or some of the things you're going to see here today. So one of the things we're doing in this contest is making our list of most viable solutions we can then serve up to Cuomo or whoever, you know, and say, hey, this is, these are some really well vetted good ideas by strong entrepreneurs. And then, you know, which ones do you want to put in place today? And, and everybody's doing this now. It's very helpful and it's very, um, uh, it's a good model for, for getting stuff done. So Deanna Dammers is our enterprise sales lead uh, for uh, MedStarter Direct. Um, and, uh, and she's been taking calls and helping people get what they need. So, okay. That's enough about MedStarter, MedStarter Direct, and everything we're doing. Let's hear what you guys are doing because that's the most interesting thing here. So Heather, when you're ready, um, whenever you want to start, Tal, uh, you can go. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm uh, Tal Givoli. I'm talking to you from Israel, and I'm co-founder of Track Virus, or Ways for Infectious Disease. When this pandemic began, we quickly came together and thought about the need to slow its spread and accelerate recovery. Now, everybody wants to return to normal, but do so in a risk-managed approach. People are justifiably anxious and confused, Governments need to manage the situation based on information, and businesses of all types want to recover. Well, Track Virus created and launched a digital platform composed of two elements to address these needs. A consumer-facing app that empowers individuals with the latest personally relevant information, encourages self-reporting uh, with behavioral psychology, and gives people notices if they need to take action due to the risk that they've been exposed to. All this in a strictly privacy-preserving manner. And these are screens from the live app that actually is in use right now. 
The other side of the solution is a back office and front end with solutions for governments and businesses. These are samples from our live dashboards. For government, this gives the ability to understand impact of their policy and manage recovery. For businesses, the ability to understand risk posed by any employee or patron requesting entrance, scanning their QR code upon entrance. All these allow returning to normal faster and while managing the risk. The opportunity is huge. Governments and businesses are already spending significant funds to accelerate recovery. The app is free for users, but governments and businesses license our dashboards and tools or branding opportunities. These are examples of the prices that would vary by scale, basically. As I explained, this is a live service in Israel on both iOS and Android in partnership with United Hatzalah, which is a large medical first responder in Israel. About 200,000 people are using track virus and about 50% are daily active users. We're also advising various Israeli agencies about dealing with the crisis. Our go-to-market is simple. Establish channels with pre-existing relationships, some of which we already have. The government or business then promotes the use of the app to the residents. We don't need mass adoption to provide value. From day one, both users and governments and businesses can get value. The competitive landscape is fairly significant. However, our key differentiators are probably the tools we provide to the governments and the businesses driving participation through behavioral psychology and empowering each stakeholder with just the right information for them. And actually Google and, a, and Apple's announcement is good for us. For us, Owen and I are serial entrepreneurs that started MedAdvisor, Dario Health, and more with significant public health experience and Ori and Avia are rock star digital health specialists. Please reach out to us if you'd like to help distribute, adopt or adapt the platform, or if you'd like to invest for impact and financial return. Track virus can truly help accelerate the recovery from this pandemic in a privacy preserving risk managed approach. Thank you. Perfect. So that you was ahead of schedule or you was right on three minutes? Right on. Wow, great job, Tal. Uh, very exciting stuff. Uh, like I said, I have questions, but let's go to the judges first. What you guys got? Tal, can you tell us uh, the technology behind the tracking and what are you tracking exactly? Certainly. So we, uh, we track, when we install the app, it, it starts tracking location, a GPS and other sensors, for example, Bluetooth, motion, mobility, and so on. So, and the, all that information is tracked and recorded on the device itself. Uh, obviously, if Google and Apple start doing this, then we'll tap into that by API. Uh, we match this with similarity of this and others. So each device gets the paths that are posing risks. And those are matched on, in a combination algorithm that's happening both on the device and in the cloud, but again, in a privacy preserving manner, no registration, no identity for the individual. Uh, what's, the the main, I'm what's the main differentiating value that um, the business or government gets from the app that the consumer does not? So the, they get, you see these dashboards, for example, uh, they can see uh, congregations of people. Where are they? What are the hot spots of risk? What are the hot spots uh, of a, a need and risk and so on? Who is adhering to policy? Where, where do they need? And that could be at the microscopic level. And they could do contact tracing uh, so they could accelerate epidemiological studies. So all of these can be done. And for the businesses, they get the ability to scan QR codes of anybody that comes into their premise and know whether they're coming in with risk. Now this, this is copying the ideas done in China, but in a privacy preserving manner. So it, without having this information available to any big brother, including ourselves. So Tal, really interested in Paulo, just curious, how does it differentiate versus the many organizations that are trying to launch some kind of contract, contact tracing solution in the marketplace? And um, how do you drive adoption? You mentioned adoption is not that important, but without high quality adoption, I'm not sure how this works. Okay, so uh, first of all, this is already live. Okay, so what you see here, these uh, this is actually a live service. You can install it. It runs in Israel right now because Israel actually publishes epidemiological studies. However, even with about a very, very small percentage of adoption through self-reporting, we could start getting risk assessment for anybody that may be in contact with them. So the risk assessment and the behavioral psychology driving a very simple a, a symptom a diagnostics to us 
uh, that's a differentiator. Usually uh, countries like in the US, for example, contact tracing without epidemiological studies is almost surely going to fail. So they need to recover epidemiological studies and Medivis, uh, sorry, and track virus allows doing this in a risk managed approach, even without full epidemiological studies. Did that answer your question? It does. And okay, so you also mentioned something of live dashboards to see where people are congregating. Are these here real time? Yeah, real time dashboards here. You could see here on the top left, uh, uh, for example, where uh, people are. Each one of those is actually a congregation of people, uh, basically. And on the right, you could see hotspots where people uh, uh, go to or issues like that. And on the bottom right, these are all live dashboards from our actual product uh, that actually you could see a adherence or lack of adherence to policies going out of their home when they're not supposed to and so on and so forth. Again, without identifying any individual. I, Tal, I have a question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's three minutes. Thanks. Um, so I will encourage everybody uh, who has questions, please put them in the chat bot, in the, not chat bot, in the chat room, uh, and Tal will answer them. Uh, you can answer them in the chat room or you can answer them offline. Also, everybody who doesn't have a judging form open, please go into the chat room and you'll see there's a link to the judging form. You can actually ask questions on the judging form and Tal will get those directly. Um, uh, uh, Alex, an idea just maybe to do that in the Q&A because in the Q&A, there's a, in Zoom, uh, you could uh, distinguish between answers, questions that have been answered already. So just as wonderful as, uh, you know, we, we messed around with the Q&A and the poll features and things like that. We find that, um, that this is more efficient, but thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, just cause we'd have to put all those questions and we'd have to, that's uh, moderated. This is more crowdsourced. Um, Anyway, so so really good job, Tal. Very impressed. Uh, I, you know, definitely deserves uh, more than a slow clap from one person, but I think you'll see in the ratings that you're going to do great. Um, so uh, so judges, if you'll take a moment and fill out um, you know your questions and answers and things like that. Um, and you know, my question while we're waiting for the judges to all be finished is, you know, this only works if it gets widespread adoption. You know, so. I guess, what's your progress in getting widespread adoption outside of Israel? And then additionally, um, you know, how is Apple and Google's, you know, um, offer to make a tracking app? I don't know if they've actually done it yet. So going to affect you as a business. In, in Israel, we got widespread, I mean, we got adoption fairly quickly. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't have until basically next week, we don't have capabilities that make it attractive for anybody to install outside of Israel. By next week, we're actually adding capabilities that allow uh, anybody in the world to install and have value that's personally relevant to them. Okay, so that uh, personalized content and alerts and risk uh, management will be available globally without epidemiological studies and without adoption by others. So okay. it does basically, solving the chicken and egg problem. Uh, however, the bigger adoption will be when we get adopted by governments, local or it could be state, city, uh, or national. Tal, so, thank you, yeah. thank you Tal. Uh, so Pat, um, can you bring, please bring up the next slide? Um, the next presenter uh, should be Jiva with uh, Harsha Rajashima. Rajashima. Sorry if I bangled your name. Um, so you can take yourself off mute. Uh, yes, Alex, I'm ready. Um, boy, your voice is nice and clear. Um, okay. So great headset. That's a good, it's always good to start with good audio. Um, okay. So we got your, your, uh, clinical supply chain idea in front here. Okay, good. Um, timer, you're ready. I assume judges, you're all ready. If not, say something. Okay. Let's go three minutes. Uh, good afternoon. I am Harsha Rajasimha, a uh, genomics data scientist and a, a patient advocate for the last several years. Uh, uh, we are on a mission at Jiva Informatics to reduce patient travel burden and bring unprecedented efficiencies to clinical trial operations. Uh, we did a, a product market fit analysis with the over 300 customer interviews and patient recruitment by, was by far the biggest problem in clinical trials. 
And when we dig a layer below that, uh, there are uh, all, many of the problems in clinical trials uh, come down to travel uh, burden on patients. Uh, uh, about a quarter of the patients uh, do not enroll in clinical trials because of where the study site is located and the frequency of travel visits. So we set out to solve the travel burden. And as, you, uh, as we learn more, there is more than 98% of all clinical trial site visits are currently brick and mortar visits, which means patients have to travel in, through various uh, travel mechanisms for every uh, phase of the clinical trial. Uh, which can, on an average, span 18 months. Uh, so uh, most of the clinical trials are currently on hold due to the COVID-19. Uh, patients are not going into the hospital sites uh, fearing uh, contracting uh, infection. Uh, so our solution is a real-time artificial intelligence-driven centralized monitoring solution with the patient-facing app for continuous data collection. Uh, with that, we are tilting the balance in clinical research to move more uh, visits from patients staying where they are at their home uh, safely and collecting data uh, more conveniently and reducing the travel burden. Uh, for MVP is where we are at uh, with uh, a, a, a anticipated completion uh, towards the end of this year and have uh, several uh, pilot projects. If we do solve the travel barrier problem that is no, shown to significantly improve uh, retention of patients in clinical trials, as dropouts is, is a significant issue as well. Our unique differentiating factors are that we are real time, uh, integrated, uh, bring all the key features in the same app uh, instead of multiple apps, and we will be uh, capable of doing FDA grade clinical um, trials which have more stringent data requirements and validation requirements. And long-term differentiators will include artificial intelligence to learn from past trials to make the next trials more efficient. It's a, a big market place uh, with our initial target uh, being cell and gene therapies. And before we get there, we can do some observational and real world evidence studies. Uh, a total of 37 billion in uh, IT market within the clinical trials. Our uh, subscription model, uh, one uh, time trial setup and a per patient subscription. Uh, we are looking for strategic partners, hospital systems and biotech companies and seeking uh, uh, 1 million in seed capital. We have a rockstar team with over 20 years of experience. Uh, all three of uh, the key management team have PhDs in biomedical AI. Uh, and uh, we have a strategic partner in Kiwi Tech to do the product development uh, as well as uh, initial investors. Thank uh, you, that was great. Thank you. So Heather, was that dingy kind of noise? Was that the, you're at a time bell? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I, I that, that wasn't, that. wasn't that clear. Okay. So uh, good job, Harsh, Arsha. Um, uh, judges, we have questions. Three minutes. Why don't you expect your solution to be re ready to be used? Uh, by September, we, uh, we anticipate our MVP will be ready. Uh, we have a current a product development roadmap um, on target for um, September release. Uh, we have a handful of pilot projects lined up already, uh, which will be uh, good for HIPAA compliant uh, level. And uh, by next year, we will have the more interventional clinical trials as well. So COVID-19 uh, is, uh, you know, there's uh, vaccine trials, which will be running multiple years, as well as um, drug repurposing and new drug trials will also be starting and running for several years. So, so we anticipate that this uh, product will be able to uh, assist uh, with reducing patient visits to hospitals and home-based trials. Sounds like it's more for COVID-20 though. Um, uh, other questions? Yep, I have questions. So uh, what oh, is- Betty, Betty, just um, for all judges, before you start talking, just say, hi, this is Betty, Cosgrove, whatever. Uh, just so, because you know, not everybody sees everybody all the time. So this is Betty talking, go ahead. Okay, go. this is Betty, sorry. Um, so what, what is your um, go-to market primarily, like your, uh, what particular sub-markets of clinical trials are you starting in other than this COVID idea? Um, you know, cell and gene therapies and vaccines uh, tend to be uh, a one and done type treatments. Uh, there's a one-time upfront therapy and long-term follow-ups. That's the niche market that we are targeting. Um, and, and so most of the vaccine trials would be a good fit for what we are building. That's the unique differentiating uh, mar market segment as well. Hey, Harsha, nice job. This is Paula Machado. 
curious, what are your thoughts around how you differentiate versus, this is a very crowded market, everybody's trying to figure out how to fix clinical trials for pharma. Um, how do you differentiate, how do you plan on differentiating yourself versus what's already accredited? Uh, yes, so you know, right now there is uh, entirely decentralized uh, where 100% uh, of all uh, site visits are done from home on, on apps or uh, uh, you know, everything is done in person at the brick and mortar site. So we are targeting the hybrid model where some visits can be in person and some visits um, at the patient's preference can be done remotely. Uh, uh, and doing that in real time is still a unsolved problem in the industry. And that's, that's our unique differentiating aspect uh, to do that in both ways, um, as well as uh, the AI um, uh, IP that we are uh, under development to learn from past clinical trials, especially around the modality of gene therapies and vaccines. What can we learn from all the past trials that uh, can help make the next trial better and more efficient? Okay. Hi, Hersha, this is Atisha. I have a question. Do you, um, what are some of the major roadblocks that you're maybe facing? The biggest roadblock is the regulatory uh, approval. So we are uh, targeting a FDA uh, pre-certification or a drug development tool certification process. Uh, uh, and, and that's a, a little bit of an uphill uh, road to get to the interventional trials, like for vaccine or gene therapies. But there is revenue to be had even before that through observational clinical trials. But the, once we get past the FDA certification, um, it, it's not a medical device, uh, what we are offering. It's more of a drug development tool, but even that has significant higher quality barriers. Uh, once we get that through that barrier, uh, I think the, the big opportunities will open up. All right, and that was great. You. Thank you. That's three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Once again, folks, uh, in the judging forum, you can ask questions, and also in the uh, in the chat room. Um, I see there's some activity in the chat room. Uh, we can also pull questions out of there. You know, in this time that we allow for the judges to finish doing the scores. Um, so Pat, if uh, you ever see any in there that look like they're interesting, uh, feel free to um, do that. Um, I'm looking through it now. I don't, I don't see anything for this particular one. Um, but great job, uh, Arsha. And Thanks for the opportunity. Records the big things and, uh, and uh, we'll be talking. Thank you. Um, so obviously it's not something we can push out right now, um, but uh, but you know certainly when you're ready uh, we should talk. Um, okay, so uh, I love the name of the next one from Tobias Gardner. So we're gonna bring up Tobias's deck. Um, I assume Tobias is here someplace. Yeah. Okay, take yourself off mute. Put your video on if you can. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, but can, we can't see. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, there's two Tobiases. No, no, no. This is one. This is one. Um, one device has troubles uh, with the audio. Okay. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You can hear and see me? We yeah. ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much for, for giving me the opportunity. Tobias, to be stop. Stop, Tobias. Oh, all right. Um, uh, so, judges, I assume you guys are ready. Heather, you ready? I am ready. So, there'll be a bell at 30 seconds, and then I'll say... And I'll do the bell again at when three minutes is up. So keep an eye on Heather's, on Heather's, Heather's uh, Hollywood Square box, and uh, you know she's like waving at you doing this, like means like stop, stop, stop. I might do that too, but we could also just turn off your audio. So now Tobias, there's two of you here. Is your co-founder or something also dialed in? No, no, no. This is one device sharing the the screen with you, and then the other device I do the audio. So this is uh, yeah. my technical setup here. Okay, that works. Um, All right. Okay, so if everybody's ready, we can go. All right, sure. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to pitch here. My name is Tobias Gantner. I'm calling in from Germany. Um, I'm the founder of the Healthcare Futurists, and one of our projects here is uh, our data against Corona faster than Corona. Everything you see here is live and online, and you can look at that. We are an international project that started out in Germany, in Switzerland, and has now gone to a, a couple of other places such as Poland and uh, Spain and also the UK and uh, the United States. What we are doing is we're looking at altruistic data donation. So you're right, it's, uh, you give away your data, whether you're sick or not, um, in our database and we uh, scramble your data with our AI algorithms to find out more about 
how does actually the, um, the, uh, the, the disease or the infection go on. I'm a medical doctor myself by training. I'm a transplant surgeon and I ever got infected by the idea of organ donation and thus um, data donation. So what we do is uh, we have a questionnaire set up where you type in your data, like your gender, your age and so forth. Um, and you also leave your data about your infection or your status, whether you are infected, whether you tested positively and, or not uh, with us. Um, we are collecting longitudinal data, which means we rely on people coming back every now and then. This is why we need a lot of bandwidth. And we see effects when we got um, press coverage in Germany or other places in Europe that more and more people come in. Uh, what happens with your data? We are um, employing our, we're using the data in our own machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms, but we do also share the data with WHO and CDC and other places who have a justifiable right to actually look at the data. Um, yes, we need to take care of data security um, and we need to connect with people. So we ask people to leave their email address with us. This is how um, um, an average um, questionnaire looks like um, and you know, you're more than welcome to join in with us and to see uh, what we're doing. This is actually we have about 12,600 uh, uh, users already. We started five weeks ago. We are not government sponsored. Uh, we do this completely pro bono. We have invested more than 12 months of uh, work in there already in this great team. We have doctors, epidemiologists, designers, um, um, data science uh, people, and also law people on our team. And uh, what we are looking up here is not money. So we, we, we're not collecting any money. We can't collect money uh, basically because we need to remain independent. We are looking for bandwidth. So wherever there's press coverage or people interested in what we do, please contact me and uh, I'd be happy to answer all the questions you might have. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to spread the word and probably be faster than Corona. Oh. I have a question. <laughs> Your presentation was faster than most. So that was great. Um, love what you're doing. And yes, um, any extra time you have from the first three minutes, um, obviously you have access to use that time for your Q and A. So uh, now we can go, go ahead. I have a question. Can you yes, hear me? Please. Remember to introduce yes. yourself, Pam. Oh yeah, I, I'm Pamela. Um, I see that you're only in um, Europe. Are you familiar with United States HIPAA regulations? Yes, we are. Uh, as a matter of fact, I went to medical school in the United States and um, uh, you make a rightful term with HIPAA regulations and all data security regulations. Um, I think this is a, a global crisis that has been caused by, or well, not I, the whole team thinks this is a global crisis that has been caused by technology that we use. People travel around. If we hadn't had technology at our hand, we'd probably not have a pandemic. And uh, we are entitled to use also modern technology in order to uh, get the pandemic at bay, uh, which means we are, well, test driving new legislation or approaches to legislation. And in my book, uh, having um, an epidemiologist education as well. I think this, what we do with the altruistic data donation enriches the toolbox that can be used by epidemiologists other than randomized controlled trials, for instance. So yes, we need to tackle the legal question. I'm, I'm pretty much on the same side as you are. And uh, I, I think German standards and European standards are pretty high as well. Um, but this is, as you, as you will probably say, terra incognita. And I invite everybody here on the call or on YouTube that follows us to join forces with us and uh, yeah, to, to see whether this is a new tool in the toolbox where we can get some more insights and knowledge about how the disease spreads and whether rumors about resulkin or ibuprofen are good or not. Uh, we want to look into the data and to probably be earlier in the data uh, then scientists that will probably come up with re results in two or three years time from now. Tobias? Yes. Can I stop you? Um, so you only have three minutes for Q&A. You want to get more than one question in. Sure. Um, so I'm, I see like your innovation, Intel's innovation, and I wonder how you guys could work together with all the other data collection. Um, please mute whoever is making all that noise. Um, or is that the timer? Okay, so how would you integrate with, with other, other providers and collectors of data? 
Well, what we do is we would offer, if this is legally possible, uh, to pool our data. So as I, again, as I said, this is not for profit. We share our data with anybody who has a justifiable right to look at the data. Uh, we have set up a curatorium of people well known in the, in the public in Europe. And we are open to any suggestions from people coming out from elsewhere. So what I'm basically doing is I'm, I'm embracing contact from anybody who's in the same boat here because we, we only live on this one planet and uh, there's a lot of things to be done and data to be collected and here we are so please contact me and we find a solution for that okay what do we got for time left heather heather i'm a little confused now you're on mute heather five seconds five seconds <laughs> okay so yes and no question well, one more question. Anybody else have a question for Tobias? Okay, I guess we'll move on. Thank you, Tobias. Great job. Thank you. Very, very inspiring what you're doing. Um, judges, if we take a moment um, and track your thoughts on the on Tobias's innovation and his amazing work in the area. Um, obviously, it's already being done. So I'm I'm filling out my form too. So. If anybody else wants to fill the space, ask questions, tell a joke, you know, <laughs> you're welcome to. Um, Why don't we get the next people to set up while you, you're doing that? Yeah, Pat, Pat's always doing that. Should I set up? Always. You always get the next guy going. Hey, let me uh, share my screen if you don't mind. Okay. Don't start talking about your project yet, though, and still, until Heather says she's ready. Um, I'm ready whenever you are. I'm not. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, the bias, one thing that occurs to me, and I filled out on my sheet, is that, you know, for a nonprofit project like yours, um, we're very happy to, you know, put you guys at the top of the page on MedStarter and things like that. Obviously, you need sources to, to fund your activities. And crowdfunding is great for that. Anyway. That would be great. Thank you so much. Highly yeah. appreciate it. We, we have a nonprofit partner that all of the donations go through. So people can get, at least in the U.S., tax deductible um, credits and such for it. So uh, it's all automatic from the moment. Thank you. Donating. So, <clears throat> okay. So I'm done with mine. Hopefully all the judges are faster than me. Um, and whenever we're ready, we can start with eloquence. Uh, you well? Okay, take it away. Can you hear me? Lance Patak. Can Eloquence. you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Lance Patak. I'm the CEO of Eloquence Communications. Our product portfolio has evolved over the years, starting with our flagship product, the EasyBoard, a point of care multilingual communication tool for patients who cannot speak or cannot speak English so they can communicate with their providers. The EasyBoard was adapted to a downloadable app and further evolved to serve as a multilingual nurse call communication system. We had just opened a 5 million Series A round before the COVID crisis. And now with 5% of COVID patients being intubated and unable to speak, we have an immediate need for $250,000 to help patients and providers get immediate access to our solutions. The reason this is relevant is because every intubated patient that emerges from paralysis will be too weak to write and unable to speak. Nurses will then have two options, to empathetically sedate them, to overcome their terror of not being able to communicate and get their needs met, or provide them an effective means to communicate. And that's where we come in. By establishing effective communication, patients require less sedation, have better outcomes, reduce morbidity and mortality, and reduce healthcare costs. Just last night, I heard a patient who was a nurse who emerged from paralysis and had terrible delirium, had no idea where they were, and they needed to communicate, but this was never discussed because of the lack of awareness. Here's the easy board and the communication application, both in Android and iOS app uh, versions. Eloquence is a multilingual nurse call communication system that takes the point of care solution, driving remote communications between patients and providers, driving efficiency and improving quality of care, but that's not the focus of this presentation. I'm gonna skip uh, the uh, streamlined communication workflow um, benefits here of eloquence for time. The market size is $2 billion. The critical care market focused with the VitaTalk application, EasyBoard is 25 million. Our team is well experienced. Oh, so sorry. Um, 
Our team is well experienced with everyone having over 15 years of experience. I'm gonna skip over this competitive advantage as well. We have five patents, uh, the last issued in January. I'm gonna also discuss the revenue model at a later time and details of the 5 million offering if there's Q&A for that. In review, we have strong customer traction. We've been in over a thousand hospitals prior to the COVID scenario. There is no other time in our lifetime I can imagine that there, we would be more relevant to improve outcomes for the most dramatically affected people struggling to survive this crisis. Um, this places our system in the center, front and center of frontline workers and uh, eloquence, although it is for patients out on the floor, being deployed, it would prevent uh, re, re, you know, back and forth of providers going in and out of rooms and reduced um, use of personal protection equipment. We do have a target uh, acquisition with Stryker and ASCOM and some other large players. Given the Hillrom um, uh, acquisition for Volt recently, the Stryker ASCOM um, acquisition is, is more attractive to us at this time. That's all. That's good. Thank you. What do we got for time? Was he on time? Uh, yeah, there's about 10 seconds left. Great. <clears throat> Very nice. Okay, great job, uh, Lance. I was actually part of the whole Starling Hillrom thing years ago. So okay. I know this space pretty well. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you're already in a thousand hospitals, meaning that you're implemented on whole floors of the entire hospital. So yeah, so the Easy Board has been around for a long time. It was a flagship disposable product that uh, just began to evolve in the healthcare IT space about eight, nine years ago. Um, and it became the standard of care, just like Pampers is for diapers or Kleenex is for tissues. When people talk about a communication board, they talk about the Easy Board. However, you know, in only a thousand hospitals, that's about a 20% uh, ding. The problem right now is with um, all of the supply chain being battered with PPE, they can't get purchase orders. They can't even get a shipping account numbers to authorize free shipment of easy boards. So we need to get free products to these hospitals in a widespread manner and fast. And the only way to do that is with immediate funding. Okay. Okay, this is Betty. I have a question. Sure. All right, so you skipped the competitive advantage. I'd like to see what your competitive advantage is. Also, what departments of the thousand hospitals are you in? Sure. So. If you take 10% of the U.S. hospital beds today, so if there's 850,000 hospital beds today, about 85,000 of those are ICU beds. Right now that have doubled because PACUs, floor beds, um, gymnasiums, they're all filling up with ICU beds. So we have doubled the number of ICU beds today. Now only about half of those patients, if you took a snapshot of all the patients in ICU that are intubated, only about half of them could use a communication board today. But that, that, those patients who can use it today are different than the ones that will use it tomorrow. So just because a patient's paralyzed today doesn't mean they're not going to emerge and need it two days from now. The competitive advantage with eloquence is, you know, they've taken a bell and they've converted this bell into so many different ways, but there's still no transparency with respect to eloquence. Um, uh, so, so patients who select a message from our tablet, it gets routed to a provider phone and it's available in multiple languages. So the nurse call system absolutely has no impact for uh, non-English speaking patients. It also doesn't capture the dark data of when that call light gets turned off. The actual delivery of care is not monitored or tracked. And so no one knows if someone even got the, the request fulfilled or how long it took them. And this is where satisfaction of care and quality of care land. Uh, this is Yolini. How many languages do you have and what are the disinfection requirements? Sure. So the easy board is disposable and it, so we do not, take any sort of liability with blood splatter and things like that in, in the proper cleaning. Uh, so this is made disposable. It's available in 20 languages. It has been deployed in 15 countries. It has even been picked up by pharma companies uh, to help promote uh, use of sedation that doesn't suppress respiratory drive like dexmedetomidine. And that we had a global um, outreach with that about five years ago. So that's the easy board. The VitaTalk app is only available in 10 languages and we've received dozens of requests to increase the number of languages. So the only way for us to respond immediately is to get immediate funding. I have a question, this is Andrea. Uh, yeah. One of the biggest problems that patients with COVID-19 have is that they can't access their families. Um, is there a way to use this tool to also access communication with the families? Yeah, so in, our, 
in our pro product pipeline is a, a partner app for the VitaTalk app that would uh, not only allow VitaTalk to convert to an eloquent solution and you know, basically send messages remotely, but also to provide for diary um, intake as well as um, you know, remote communications. Uh, we just have not got that developed yet. And I don't know that we're gonna be able to get that executed successfully within 30 days, but certainly within the next three months we could do if we were funded. All right, that's great, thank you. Um, this is Atisha. I just wanted to say, I actually had a recent experience. It's more of a, a comment than a question uh, with my grandma I'm in a language barrier. And uh, to Andrea's point, if you can add in a um, FaceTime feature, that would be excellent. Absolutely. Um, because the face, the face uh, with the language barrier, especially, um, well, I'm from India, uh, there's, a di there's a lot of different dialects. Um, and so if there's someone that's in the middle communicating, if you don't have that language um, in your app, that would probably be very beneficial. It would, especially for the speaking patient. We, we are integrating with a video interpreter service company that provides us a one-touch access to telephonic and video interpreter services. Um, and so that's, that's, that falls into the pipeline, correct? Agreed, much added value. That's, that's great, thank you. Thanks for uh, keeping it real for us, Tisha. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, uh, so thanks, great job, Lance. Um, if judges, you'll take a moment to do your, uh, do your judge forms and things like that. And Pat, if you'll bring up our uh, Emanante and Neil uh, Diener, if you'll go ahead and um, Unmute yourself and get ready for your your moment. Um, yeah, I'm ready to go. If you can hear me. And if I recall, you're doing it from your own desktop. Okay. You might want to go full screen on that. Um, there you go. Well, I'm doing it right. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. You guys are driving. That's bad driving. Okay. Whichever way you guys decided to do it. Clearly, I have no idea. <laughs> um, so, Pat, what is this? The fourth or the fifth? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fifth. I don't know. There's no numbers on the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, it's just, we try to get it's everything done. Fifth. Well, Pat and I, you know, usually make a list of what I'm doing and what he's doing, but today he did everything. And so, of course, at the end of the day, I was just 10 minutes before we started, I was like, well, what about these three things? And of course, you know, that's one of the things. Um, so, but he did fantastic. He did everything. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, so I guess all the judges, you guys are ready. Heather, you ready? Yep. Okay, Neil, you ready? Take ready. It. Hi, I'm Neil Diener. I'm the CEO of m and Wireless, and thanks for listening to our pitch. Next. All right. <laughs> so a little bit of background on uh, m and the company and the team. So we are an existing uh, startup. Uh, we build sensor-based solutions to monitor equipment in hospitals. Our main customer is the Cleveland Clinic. Um, we, we basically are serial entrepreneurs. This is our third startup together. We sold our last two startups to Cisco Systems and Motorola. Next. So because uh, we are sensor guys, the Cleveland Clinic reached out to us and said they're interested in monitoring COVID-19 patients who are recovering at home. Um, and according to the Cleveland Clinic, and we also confirmed this with doctors at University Hospital, the best early indicator of distress for a remote COVID patient is actually their respiratory rate. There's been a lot of focus on SpO2, but that's really a late indicator because the patients tend to breathe faster over time to maintain their SpO2 level and then suddenly it crashes. So if you could monitor their respiratory rate over time, it would be a, a good leading uh, indicator, uh, but it's not easy for people to measure their own respiratory rate. So the concept is a simple smartphone app to help home users, home people who are recuperating at home to do it. Next. These were the requirements from the Cleveland Clinic. They wanted an iPhone and Android app, works on everyone's phone. It measures your breathing rate for about a minute. Can't require any external device so anyone can use it. It's very easy to use, accurate, and then stores the measurements in Apple Health Kit or Google Fit so they could see the trend. And of course, they need it as soon as possible. Next. We'll see. So we went out and did an initial sprint, uh, prototype the app for the iPhone. We looked at a couple of methods of doing this, uh, PPG, which uses light, the microphone, uh, and those all looked uh, complicated uh, and variable across phones. So we settled on using uh, a torso approach where the, the user lies down, puts the phone on their uh, abdomen and breathes for a minute, and we measure the movement of the phone on the accelerometer. Next. 
We tested about on about 80 people just to give you a look under the cover what it looks like. Um, it's not an easy problem. You have things with coughing and the phone moving around. And we baked off several algorithms until we got to our, a point where we we're at 95% accuracy. And essentially accuracy for us means that if there's a good set of data, we give you the answer and it's the right answer. And if the phone fell off you or it moved around, then we tell you to try again. Next. Uh, we need to do a sprint too to fix some bugs and integrate data from evaluation. We need to do an Android version and get it on the App Store. And of course, we think there'll be a support phase. Next. So we're looking for some help. Being a startup, we need some funding, about 75 to 150K. Different models were flexible. Could be an angel investment or could be app licensing with healthcare systems, white label or SDK. Done. Hi, this okay. is Betty. I have a question. Um, why would, why are you putting the phone on someone's abdomen? Why aren't you using it wirelessly to a, a, a secondary device? I'm not convinced that somebody would want to put a phone on their abdomen. Right. That was a requirement from the Cleveland Clinic, at least from their viewpoint, they wanted something that scaled as big as this could be or, and so there are some hospitals that are distributing devices, but then you're limited by how many devices you had and how you get them to people. So the idea was this thing requires no external device whatsoever. It just works with everyone's phone. Neil, does it matter if the patient is obese? Uh, you know, uh, we tested it. Basically, you just have to kind of light. If you're really obese, it could, this phone could slide off. We just have to kind of lightly hold it with your hand. I think this is a great idea, by the way. Thank you. If I had the money, I would fund you. <laughs> oh. Speaking of the money, I mean, it sounds like you're sort of building this to Cleveland Clinic spec. Are they right. not funding it? Do they want to, have they offered a contract? They're in the evaluation phase right now and we expect that we could get a licensing deal from them. I mean, honestly, if we could fund this ourselves and give it to everyone, we would. So the angel method is one way of doing it. Um, otherwise we have to go try to ask hospitals to pay to distribute it. Did you have a, a, uh, a revenue um, slide? I don't, I remember seeing that. What's your, What's your uh, revenue model? For this app, it's really, we just want to, you know, do good by COVID and make enough money that we're, you know, we don't go bankrupt in the interim. But as an investor, I want you to be sustainable. That yeah, now as an investor, as an angel investor, what's a little complicated here is that, you know, we, there is an existing company with existing products. And so I think the discussion would be you probably want to understand more about what our company does and what besides this application. Valid. Is okay. there other, other use case apart from COVID-19? You know, I've been asked that and I don't know the answer to that. There, there could be. By the way, I, I, another thing I, I forgot to mention, we can, from a lot of the data, we've seen that generally, in addition to the respiratory rate, we can, we can get pulse rate also. Believe it or not, that shows up in the accelerometer. This is Pamela again. I think uh, another use case would be for a pneumonia patient. Since pneumonia, pre pneumonia is a precursor to COVID-19, especially for people treating themselves at home. That makes sense, for sure. Okay. Um, do we have more questions? Anything coming in through the chat window? Um, other judges? Uh, yeah. can, One can question you? is, uh, can people use an Apple Watch instead of an iPhone? You know, the, there's rumors that the Apple Watch is going to do uh, pulse oximetry, but it's it's not out yet. Well, this isn't pulse oximetry either, though, is it? It's, it's, it's not. I mean, but pulse, if you do pulse oximetry, you can get respiratory rate as a secondary. It's kind of a amplitude modulation on top of the pulse oximetry. Okay. Oh. Pretty cool. Uh, okay, so any other questions? Judges, take your time, fill out the form. People who aren't judges, if people are interested, members of the community, uh, we encourage you to as well. Um, uh, thank you, uh, that was a very good presentation and well done, Neil. Thank you. Uh, glad you guys are doing what you're doing. I will caution people, you know, you know, working with these large institutions, um, they tend to want something and we all want to work with them, but they're sort of sometimes will take advantage of our desire to work with them and not pay us. 
unpaid pilots and custom software development projects like this one, uh, or making us pay them to do a clinical study, um, or taking your IP and then licensing it back to you and maybe they'll invest in you someday. We've seen everything under the sun happen. Now, obviously, Neil, you guys are very experienced. They're your close partner. Um, but just as a word to the wise, just be careful when going with these large institutions. It's one of the things as investors, we've, we've learned to coach and enable and negotiate, you know, with our teams, for our teams. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's always a challenge, um, especially with the larger academic medical centers. So, yeah, and speaking of big business, uh, Joanne, would you like to take us on uh, our workout journey for our break? So this is, this is the break. We have like 10, 15 minutes. You guys can do whatever you want. Um, in the previous weeks, we've done uh, a dance break. Uh, we've oh, done, wow. Uh, yeah, we did a TikTok. We actually did dance breaks every week in, to some extent, but some are more successful than others. We did uh, the second week, uh, Eugene led us on a, uh, a TikTok dance, you know, uh, the, the right, left foot, right foot dance. If anybody's familiar with it, you know, left foot, right foot. Anyway, um, last week, Ami Shah, the winner, incidentally, uh, led us on a Bollywood uh, dance. It was a silent Bollywood dance, so it really wasn't perfect. But, you know, it was okay. Um, and, uh, and last week, we also had, um, we had a lot of drinking involved. So uh, it's been noted that maybe the reason I got COVID this week was because I wasn't that healthy last week. So I'm trying to do better this week. So I invited my friend, Joanna Stahl, uh, who runs GoToPractice uh, to, um, to work out with us. Now, we did this with her about three weeks ago. Uh, we had like, what, 18 people there or something? It was pretty great. Um, I know me and George and Pat, probably not Pat so much, but a lot of us were very sore afterward. Uh, she has what she calls the move of the day. I'll let her tell you about that. Um, and she also has a great startup that um, is, is not just about individual classes, uh, but she can tell you about go to practice as well if she likes. Um, she went through our, our virtual accelerator we did uh, uh, last month. And, uh, and you know, they're on our watch list now and uh, continuing to get advisement, although she doesn't always listen to me. I will listen to her in the next... 15 minutes though, as I try to follow along. So anybody who wants to exercise with us, feel free to join us. If not, turn off your camera. Yeah, I'm looking, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna watch if I can. Um, so my name is Joanna Stull. I, I do, I also teach for Equinox and Crunch here in New York City. Um, I try really hard not to videotape myself. So this is cool that it's on Zoom and feel free. I know Pat, you're probably videotaping this. Just don't post it anywhere. I say inappropriate things all the time. Um, so yes, I do have a startup. It's called Go-To Practice. Let's stretch while we do this. So if you are playing along here, I might. Anybody other than you and me? We got Aline. Hey, there we go. Pat, feel free to get rid of everybody okay. who's not playing with us. No, uh, you know what? They're probably all voyeurs. It's all virtual. <laughs> actually, well, doesn't well, I'd like to see a screen with just the people exercising. I don't need to see. All right, so I'm trying you know, to watch you. Someone put your put your knees out to the side and then put your hands on your knees and drop your hips all the way to the floor. How, how long do I have? You said five minutes this morning. Now you said 15. Which one? Uh, well, no, the break is like 15. I would say I wouldn't work us out too hard. Okay, well, just a quick stretch. Okay, quick stretch, quick stretch. I'm watching. So what are we doing? All right, so the idea is to just get your hips as low to the ground as you can, especially because you guys are sitting at a desk all day. And then drop a shoulder and look over the other shoulder. And then switch, kind of just keep pushing your leg out to the side. And so I make up a move of the day. It's always compound. I did it already. It's already posted for today if you want to check out what it looks like. But this is the slow motion version. So put your right foot forward and your left foot back like you're doing your lunge. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to slide your left leg back and put your left hand on the floor. So a really deep lunge. So your fingertips and your toes are at the same spot. If you drew a line across, it's equal. I can't tell if you're doing it, so I'm assuming you are. Now take your right hand on the floor and your right leg back up in the air. So you've got two hands on the ground and your left foot on the ground and your right butt cheek squeezed. And then you bring your knee all the way to your chest like you're going to hit yourself in the shin and swing your heel up to the ceiling. And then do a push-up. Okay, then bring your right leg back. And then come all the way up. So just shake it out, start over. 
There you go, back up. Okay, so same thing, other side. So slide your right leg back, start with the lunge, and get lower and lower and lower. Put your right hand on the floor, so it's a really deep stretch. Your left hand and your left leg, so squeeze your left butt cheek, so your knees come into your chest, and then hips all the way to the ceiling. And then do a little push up, and then come back. All right, we're gonna go slow one more time, super slow. So left hand, left leg, slide it back, take your time, get as low as you can, drop your hips to the floor. I'm watching. Okay, right hand, right leg. Bring your knee to your chest, swing your hips up to the ceiling, into a push up, and raise that. Now, push ups only count if you touch your chest to the floor. The right hand, right leg, not your hips, just your chest. Left hand, left leg. Knee into your chest, swing it to the ceiling, and into a push up, and then come on back up, and then shake it up and around. Okay, so now, real quick, put your arms over your head, as tall as you can be, and then pull yourself over to one side. So everybody kind of stops and they think this is as far as they can go, and they're wrong, just keep going. And then come on up and then switch. So they bend each spot and you're like, oh, I'm good, and you're not. Keep going. As far as I can. Good. Okay. And then in the front, take your arms and pretend I'm pulling on you. So pull your shoulders apart and let your neck drop. And then put your hands behind your back. If you can't, if you can't interlace them, that's fine. You can just put your hands on your low back and squeeze. But try to open up your shoulders and pull your whole body back. Yeah, that's what happened. Everybody put your hands together. Yeah. Okay. So from here, just real quick, unlock your knees and lean over. So you're doing a deadlift with your arms behind your back, especially if you sat at the desk for the day. And see how low you can go and then bring your arms over your head. I'm totally watching. And then roll up super slowly, arms in front of you, shake it out. All right, we're going to do it. This is like if we were going to videotape this and then you had to be posted and everybody's going to watch this for the next 20 years, so don't mess up. <laughs> okay, so right arm right, we're doing that whole move. This is the move of the day. So we're doing slow ones and then fast ones. So right arm, right leg, sink into it. Got it. Left arm, left leg, knee in, swing up, into a push up. Bring your left leg back, and then bring your body back up. All right, left arm, left leg, big lunge, right leg back, right hand down, knee in, swing up, into a push up, and then come back up. And then we're gonna move a little faster, and then we're gonna go super fast. So right arm, right leg, nice and slow, smooth, left leg, left arm, knee in, swing up, push up, Left side back, left arm, left leg, right arm, right leg, knee in, swing up, push up. All right, so your last one, go for speed. So ready, right arm, right leg, smooth and fast, knee in, swing up, push up, come on back, jump if you want to. Right arm, right leg, knee in, swing up, push up. That's it. Did you get it? Okay, so my dare for you is to actually videotape yourself doing that outside in a park somewhere. <laughs> okay, and then make sure we use the uh, hashtag. Hashtag, go to practice. Go. Fitness directory. It's an inclusive website for every gym on demand. Uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, Gold's Gym just announced that they're permanently shutting 30, 30 clubs, which is, you know. That's crazy. So if you have any fitness industry stuff, I play in the fitness world. Yes. Well, you definitely play hard. So thank you for tiring us all out and making us appreciate that we're just going to be listening to pitch contests the rest of the time. I know speaking Oh, to I'm impressed well. over there. You're doing good. <laughs> yeah, there's some great teams. Uh, hopefully do some good stuff. So thank you yeah. for joining us, Joanna. And if anybody needs to like take two minutes or whatever, feel free. We're not going to get started again for another minute or two. Uh, so when uh, are you gonna launch your uh, your directory? When what's what's your launch plan? No much. Uh, it's live. It's big, you know. It's onboarding. Uh, my my deal with the professional sports athletes might um, take a while now.
because of the WNBA and everything. But um, no, everything's live and ready to roll. Um, it's kind of cool how many people are being let go of pretty awesome organizations that I can steal now. <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, one door opens, one door closes, the other one opens. So, um, yes, we, uh, we had a little powwow about kind of like what's next and how clubs are going to open and watching Asia and all of that stuff. Yeah. So if we want to go to your site, it's just go to practice.com. Yeah. Go to practice.com. If you're an operator, it's just forward slash business. Um, yeah. But I mean, to be honest, you're, you're looking at gyms, which are unlikely to have updated hours, but they're pretty much all closed. Yeah, hence the need for virtual gyms. So, okay, wonderful. Good to hear from you. Good to get the update. Patrick, are you back? Are you uh, are you uh, on break still? He fell. Yeah. Well, I didn't see how many people were actually doing the exercise. I was having too much trouble just doing it myself, and I definitely could not do that behind the back thing. I mean, I can. Oh, really? You need to work on that. It's good for your chest. I mean, even when I got arrested last year, the cops had to use like two pairs of handcuffs just because like, my arms couldn't get that close together. No, no, put, your, put the back of your palms on your lower back. Put the back of my that? palms. Yes, I can do that. And then That's, yeah, this is the officer side. <laughs> yeah. they, they don't get that close. Anyway, right. and let that be a lesson to you kids. No texting and driving. So, which is actually what I got arrested for, um, believe it or not. So, uh, okay. So Pat is still not here. Okay, so I guess we'll... Alex, I was planning on uh, loading my, uh, sharing my screen. I okay, can do so that if you want. You can do that. We can actually perhaps operate without Pat. Um, uh, so if you want to share your screen, oh, look at that. Yep. Can you see my see screen? Heather? Look at that. Heather is here. Um, but I don't know if all of our judges are here. So, uh, so you guys chime in. Uh, I see Andrea is here. Betty looks like she's off in the field. Paula's there. Pamela's here. Pamela's there, Ivy. Tisha's here. Tisha, good. Deanna, she's probably on a direct call. Ah, Pat's back. Um, okay, so Pat, I'm gonna ask you to run the show for a minute. Okay. Uh, for, you know, I'll be back as soon as I can. And um, take it away. And you can see my screen? Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Is Heather oh. still there now? Okay, I'm sure. I'm ready. So, ready? I'm ready when you are. Ashok. Yes. Ashok Kapoor from Hawkeye MedTech. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, we have a telemedicine platform I wanted to tell you about. So, uh, some time ago, I had been taking care of my loved ones in Florida. They were both uh, chronic, uh, severe chronic diseases, multiple chronic diseases, and me and my partner had to go out to Florida from Maryland. We live in Maryland had to go out and take them to the doctor's, ho doctor's offices on a very regular basis. And I thought there must be a better way to solve this problem. So we developed Total Care, a HIPAA compliant platform that helps patients get scheduled virtual visits with their healthcare providers. Telemedicine is in news all the time. So a lot of people know what telemedicine is. How are we different? Many of the competitors have records that are not transportable. So when you leave them, your records don't go with you. With Total Care, records stay with you. Instead of on-call providers, we connect you to your healthcare team. So you get continuity of care as opposed to just episodic care that you get through other providers. We're not a subscription-based. We are a paper call uh, model, and we have a lot of other salient features that uh, set us apart from uh, our competitors. It is simple. It's available on Apple Store and Google Play. Patients download it, onboard themselves, find the provider on the list, find an available time slot, but, uh, tell them what the chief complaint is. They can optionally add vitals. They can add pictures, videos. And then when time comes, <coughs> get on a video call with the provider. They can add family members, and the provider can add a uh, specialist on the call if they want. I've actually seen it being used in, in, uh, at, at one of the provider offices to rule out COVID-19. It was pretty exciting how they were able, the provider was able to do an examination assessment and be able to rule out COVID-19. That was cool. Um, what are we trying to do? Our sales and marketing strategy is to go uh, individual providers, partner with other organizations, 
go to insurance companies, regional hospital, local health departments, and trying to give uh, for COVID-19 in the state of Maryland, we are offering it free for uh, uh, 30 to 60 days so uh, providers can get on board, use it, and stay safe and uh, avoid unnecessary exposure to COVID-19 for them and their patients. Here's our revenue projections. By 2024, we, uh, we projected to be $115 million revenue. Use of funds, we are uh, self-funded with $150,000. We won a grant in Howard County for $50,000, looking for 1.5 uh, mil. And here is our use of funds. We plan to grow this uh, from a telemedicine to a much bigger platform. Here is our star team. Please help us join in our passion to improve healthcare delivery. Thank you. Great. Great job. Any questions for judges? I have a question. Do medical yes. records vary between states? Do medical records vary between states? No, yes. medical record is medical record. Your soap notes, your uh, evaluation, all that stuff is pretty standard. Are the laws different between the states? There are probably some differences in laws from state to state. The uh, license to practice medicine is controlled by each jurisdiction, which is each state. But many, many states are forming a compact which allows a provider that is licensed in one state to be able to see patients in all the other states. For example, in the state of Maryland has a law that says uh, uh, doctors uh, licensed in the state of Maryland can do teleconsults with any state that is adjoining Maryland. That includes Virginia, DC, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Delaware. And state of Florida passed a law a few months ago that allows any provider, any doctor that is uh, licensed in any other state to be able to do uh, telemedicine visits in the state of Florida. So great. I think you've limited yourself to Medicare and Medicaid medical records. You'd have an easy time, all 50 states. That's just a comment. So who's going to pay? This is Andrea. Who's going to pay the per call fee? Oh, uh, uh, the provider the, uh, the provider pays us a per call fee because the provider gets uh, can build the insurance and get reimbursed from the insurance. So we, we take a, a small per call fee from the provider. There is nothing that we charge the patient. Okay. Hi, this is Atisha. I, I have a question. Um, are, you, are you working with doctors already? And, and how do the physicians uh, feel about a service like this? Like, what are their thoughts on it? Right. Yes, thank you. Yes, we do have a few life providers already that are using it on a regular basis. Um, they like it. It is a hesitation to them to adopt new technology because a lot of the providers that we have are not that tech savvy. So I know the tech savvy ones are pretty easy to adopt and they can see it. And what it takes me, I think one or two demos with them to get used to it. And after that, they love it. Providers say, oh my God, this is so easy. And one of the providers said, made a comment that this is just like seeing their patients in the exam room. Got it. Kishore, Thank you. Uh, can you explain to me how you plan to compete against the um, EMRs that have some type of tele tool built in to their EHRs? Right. There are a few uh, uh, EHRs that have a telemedicine platform on it, but many of them do not. Um, and if you go to the bigger ones, Epic and Cerner and, and all the other ones, they don't even have plans to do uh, telemedicine as, as part of the solution. Some of the private physician EMRs, the uh, private practice EMRs, a mm -hmm. couple of them have it, and we will not compete with them because they already have an integrated solution. Right now, we are not integrated. If you look at our uh, uh, plan, we do have a plan for EMR integration. Currently, we, are, we do not have EMR integration standalone. What we are is we uh, are That's a, great. That's three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ashraf. Uh, so. next? Yeah, just let me know when you're uh, ready, Pat, and I'll just tell you next slide when I'm done. Okay. Yeah. So, um, 
Uh, so judges, if you'll take a moment, fill out your forms. Ashok, if you want to finish that last thought, sorry, I was on mute there. Um, you know, you can, you can finish it. Thank you. So as I was saying, the EMRs that already have a, a telemedicine platform built in, we will not compete with them. Um, right now, what we say is use total care as a substitute for a physical patient. So instead of a physical patient, you have total care. Do everything else that you do as a normal part of your examining and evaluating a patient. Great. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great job. Uh, thanks for uh, for participating, and uh, I think we should be ready for our next guy. Uh, Ian. Um, Ian. So you guys should be queued up with your true triage, Ian Hamilton. Uh, Heather, I assume you're ready. Judges, if you're not ready, please say something. Okay, we're going to assume your silence is consent. So, uh, whenever you're ready, you can get going, Ian. All right. Um, hi, I'm Ian Hamilton, CEO of True Triage, and we are enhancing 911 lines with telehealth nurse triage services. Next slide. Almost 3 million people are sent to the ER unnecessarily every year, costing the medical system around $5.3 billion. These people can be triaged by us and sent to alternative care, saving local EMS agencies, insurers, healthcare systems, about, 15, about $1,850 per patient and reducing the bill for the most vulnerable patient populations drastically. Next slide. In the current system of patient calls 911, the operator then triages the patient and determines if they are high risk or low risk case, and then dispatches an ambulance, which takes the patient to the ER. Next slide. With our HIPAA compliant system, the patient calls 911, the operator then triages the patient and determines if they are a high risk or low risk case, and then transfers the low risk patients over to one of our registered nurses along with all patient data gathered. Our nurses then use a phone triage protocol that's been continuously improved since the 1980s to triage the patient. They send a two-way SMS tech message to um, smartphone users, and that establishes a two-way video connection between the patient and the nurse. The nurse then can determine the patient disposition and advise home care, an urgent facility, or direct the patient to a temporary site in times of crisis like COVID-19. Um, if the patient does not have reliable transportation, we can send them at Uber Health to reach their destination. Next slide. We have two revenue streams, our triage service, which is built in an $85 per call basis, and our SaaS model, which sells our platform to cities or programs that want to use their own nurses. We plan to start working with local governments to prove our cost at first and then switch to working with healthcare systems and insurers, which see a much greater savings. Next slide. We estimate around a $1.35 billion marketplace in the United States for the service, and we're currently targeting Maryland as an early adopter as the state's healthcare system is a high incentive to save as much as possible. Next slide. We have um, um, other competitors, but none have a comprehensive solution like us. Other solutions require certification to use an entire system build out that can cause upwards of a million dollars or require the nurses to be physically located in the 911 center. Next slide. And then our team has a diverse background suited for this venture, um, experience in EMS, nursing, legal sales, and software development. Next slide. Um, we have a great advisory board with top emergency physicians, doctors and population health, business leaders with healthcare experience and marketing. Next slide. And guys, I think we're out of time, right, Heather? No, the, the no still 30 that's seconds. the 30 seconds. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, we, started like 25. <laughs> we, we started off in 2019 with a loss, but expect to be cash positive a few months after our first customer. We have very asset light model and partnerships allow us to drastically limit costs and scale very quickly. Next slide. We currently have a live software MVP and interest from all over the country. And then next slide. We are looking to raise. That's great. That, that is three minutes. Thank you. That's great. Rounds. Thank you. Uh, next slide will give the contact information. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, so, do we have uh, questions from the judges, audience? Anyone? Yeah. How much liability insurance are you carrying? <laughs> we Right now, we have a 2-4 um, uh, policy. So, we're carrying about $4 million. Um, some of our partners also have large insurance policies and um, the risk is actually pretty low um, based on these protocols. There's never been a worse outcome in the 40 years almost they've been used. Okay. So Again, okay. nice job, says Paulo. Just curious, um, <clears throat> using people hard to scale, 
a lot of chatbots out there doing triage and other technologies that are much more easy to scale. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I mean, th this can be used and, and scaled pretty easily with some of our partnerships. We're working with some of the software vendors that are actually in 911 centers, and it's very easy for us to transfer the data and plug directly into the systems. Um, so really, it's just a matter of time of scaling. In addition to that, um, CMS has actually just started a government program to fund 60 nurse triage centers around the country. And we already know, based on the few public centers that are out there, that we can do it for much cheaper than anybody um, that would be willing to start their own. So what's, what's the barrier to adoption here? I mean, it sounds like you've got a good solution. It sounds like you've had a lot of conversations. Why, why, aren't, why don't you have a first sale? Um, the reason is we honestly weren't planning on starting to implement this till the middle of the year. And um, when COVID hit, we really ramped up our process because people were asking us. And right now we're in negotiations. We literally just went live. Um, we're about to do the HIPAA audit. So we should be up and running fairly soon. Where, in what, what, what locality? Um, we, we have a couple that we're, we're talking to. Um, is some in Washington State, California, um, some places in the Northeast. We've had inquiries from Texas, so kind of all over. But this is primarily for COVID triage? Um, it, it can be used for COVID, but this is long-term as well. So it, it, it can work for COVID and work long-term um, to reduce all these factors. So what are the markets, this is Betty, what are the markets are you thinking about um, going towards? Like um, what type of disaster markets? Um, right, this can be used in a pandemic situation, um, but this actually alleviates a lot of the stress on the healthcare system in general. Um, so we see um, the 911 market really focusing on that, but we've already had talks with a lot of large players that our system can be used for uh, teletriage and our software in various forms like a teledoc almost or um, a lot of other different uh, mediums. So our software is very versatile. Um, we really want to focus on the 911 space because no one else is in this right now. Uh, okay, more questions? I'll ask a question from the chat. Go for it. Uh, so Candice uh, Pen Pentaga, sorry, got the name. How does this compete with typical nurses on call through most healthcare centers? Yes, um, so this competes because this plugs directly into the 911 line. There's some data transfer issues there. Um, a lot of the 911 lines actually have legacy systems that haven't been changed for, since the uh, 1950s. So we can connect with anything that's way back um, in technology or the latest and greatest technology. And that integration is actually pretty hard to do. Okay, so. All right, that's great. That's three minutes. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, so that is our what seventh presentation. Uh, so if we can queue up our eighth, uh, which is Elemento uh, by Arup Roy. Hey, Herman. Alex, can I just drive on my own screen screen share, or do you want to drive yeah. it for me? You could. Uh, can I do that? Hey, try screen. Yeah, it's the only barrier is you. So give it a try. All right, here we go. You guys able to see that one? Should yeah, we always do worry that you know people are going to mess it up. So it looks like you can handle it. Um, okay, so but we do have to wait a minute and make sure the judges are all ready. Everybody's got all their data in, I hope. Um, Heather, of course, you got your all reset, I'm sure. Um, cool. Um, all righty then. Uh, I see Aline is still looking down. She's probably just playing on her phone. What time is it there in Barcelona? It's like midnight. Thank you. Nearly, yeah, nearly. Yes, well, we appreciate you making it here. Um, you know, Manish, Manish, uh, I asked him, he was in London, he said it was too late for him. But, uh, but he's also dealing with COVID too, so. Anyway, so, okay. Uh, so we've got uh, three minutes. Take it away whenever you're ready. Great. I'm Dr. Arup Roy Berman. I'm former uh, medical director of the ICU at UCSF Children's, where we developed the prototype for Elemento. 
Elemento is a B2B SaaS cloud solution that helps hospitals get their frontline teams ready and prepared for any priority. With COVID, everyone's suffering the same pain, and that allowed us to scale with a COVID-specific module, helping teams with communication, point of care training, and shared best practices. We're built on AWS, no PHI, simple to install, live in as little as one day. Um, we've been doing this now for three years, pre-COVID. Our revenue has steadily grown. Our SaaS right now is 800K. Um, we are proud to say we've had zero churn. Our cl clients span five states, from California to New Jersey to the, the Gulf Coast. This is the problem that we're tackling, that gap between knowledge and frontline practice. COVID is only straining that even more with the f how, fastly it, how fast it is changing. When we look at any one of our hospitals tackling COVID, they're bringing on all kinds of new practices. You're up in your tent, you've got your PPE, you're doing swabs. But when you look at it, are they doing it the right way? You know, that swab's coming in at an angle. That only gets the front of the nose. You need to go straight back to get the back to get the right sample. You've got multiple people around an aerosolized procedure, putting a lot of people at risk who don't need to be there. Why is this guy not wearing a face shield when everyone else is? People are not following the right practices. It puts their patients at risk and puts themselves at risk. And how is it that we are trying to train up our people as we do in hospitals today? At the departmental level, we use 20th century analog processes, binders, flyers, posters above the toilet, uh, disconnected staff meetings and flurries of email. It's just a lot of noise. We help our leaders pull out the key nuggets from here and transform it into bite-sized knowledge whether it is checklist, it's text, it's videos, it's photos, it's quick and easy, right in your pocket, an undiluted message to all of your asynchronous or distributed staff. With that, we've got improvement in communication, a readily updatable single point of truth for everybody with a feedback loop to measure engagement, point of care training that keeps your workforce agile and re ready to adapt to changing needs, and sharing of best practices through the cloud. So if one institution is doing it well, don't start from, the, don't start from the reinventing the wheel, share it from others and adapt. We've been doing it as mentioned for years. We've got published peer reviewed results showing improved outcomes and saving of a lot of money. We're cloud-based, land in one unit or one problem, prove it, land and expand. That brings us to an opportunity here. We're raising 1.5 million of new capital to grow sales and marketing and product and with product, the exciting piece is we, we landed today, this week, with the American College of Emergency Physicians to develop a freemium model to go out to EDs across the United States for free by next month. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's three minutes. Great job, Arup. Um, you remind me of uh, when Michelle Longmire first came out of UCF SF with her Together app. And, um, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've talked to Michelle before. Yeah, she she won our first crowd challenge. We ran. Oh, eight. really? Was, awesome. Yeah, before when when she was smaller than you guys, when she was still a resident there. But um, anyway, so uh, excellent presentation. You can definitely see the Silicon Valley, uh, you know, shine on it. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stop babbling now and let the three minutes begin. Uh, judges, uh, do you have any questions for Arup? Yes. Um. How do you validate all the information that you put in, in the app? Because at the moment, there's so many different information co coming for, for COVID like every day. Yeah, so what, what we do in each one of our clients, they have the ability to, uh, the local unit manager is able to approve all content that comes in. So as they are selecting, they target the content they want, they can upload it themselves or have us transform it for them. So every piece of content is approved by a local manager and tracked that way. In our freemium model, the American College of Emergency Physicians is putting their stamp on all content. So everybody's getting something validated by the National Emergency Medicine Body. Arif, what's the difference between, or are you distinguished between best practices and what the CDC says or recommends via the PPE? So what we have the opportunity here to do with each one of our clients 
is we can bring in those national guidelines, such as what CDC says, but then allow the local hospital to be able to customize for their own unique needs. So you know what, CDC may have a guideline on PPE. However, here we are in New York City where we have a shortage of PPE, and this is what our reuse practice is. So we balance that uh, standardization, if you will, with local customization. This is Betty, I have a question. Um, so if uh, someone's a hospital in St. Louis is using this and a hospital in New York is using this, et cetera, um, how are they learning from the mistakes from New York to do better since you know the roll around for the maximum height of COVID is later for them in St. Louis? Exactly, so um, in this particular situation, we're using that code, COVID lens. We have, if you will, a central clearinghouse through through ASAP. And in all of, we have visibility to what each one of our clients are doing, what they are bringing into the app. And everybody has the ability to submit feedback as to what's useful for them or what is not useful, what could be better. So as we get this data back, we're able to then tell the people in St. Louis, hey, you know, this is what New York has found very effective in a short PPE situation and then deliver that practice. Okay, more questions? I recognize jobs as Paulo. Just if you could talk a little bit more about the business model. Yeah, so we're a land and expand model. So uh, you start with uh, one, one contract and one unit or one problem set. And that is a SaaS based on unlimited users for your given department. But once um, you know, you've got that local value in one unit, they tell their peers and then we grow into other units and grow it up. And so in that sense, our older contracts steadily grow up into the six figures. So again, a SaaS, generally speaking, an a annual contract with some we do a month to month. So just ballpark, what's the average monthly contract with any given client and what do you think it's gonna be over time? So with a, a medium sized hospital, about 200K. So however you would split that out into a per month. What is that coming into about? Uh, per year is fine. Per year is fine. Yeah, per year is fine. And what do you think of that, that 200 is going to grow to over time? So that 200, if we're looking at that 200K per hospital for a medium sized hospital, we see that on the clinical end alone. They are now starting to end, uh, expand to their non clinical folks as well. So that's then bring, pushing us up to 250 to 300K for a medium sized hospital. We have deployed also in post-acute care, so skilled nursing and hospice, and we've deployed in, in um, clinics. So altogether, total market value on that bottom-up estimate of about two billion. Although, frankly, I think we can push more. That's a conservative number. That's great. Thank you. That's three minutes. That's great. Thanks. I'd, I'd also like to, to welcome uh, Dr. Mishra to the audience. I see that you're, you're online today. It's good to have you. Sherrod does a lot of our, um, at Minnesota Ventures, he does a lot of our due diligence prep. Uh, it's been with us since the beginning with Minnesota Ventures. Say hi, Sherrod. Hey guys. Hope you guys are uh, making the best use of this thing, this isolation. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you can see, Pat and I aren't in the same room this week because Alex got COVID. So anyway, uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're doing better this week than usual. Um, so feel free to pipe up with any questions or comments, Rod. Did you just get here or you've been here for a while? No, I just got here. I got in early, but you guys were busy exercising, so I decided to take another meeting in the meanwhile. Yeah. He also, his day job now is working for uh, Ventures, um, doing some big deals and all sorts of cool stuff with uh, startups. So anyway, welcome, Shrod. Uh Okay, so I think that's enough time for everybody to have done their judging and such. So I'm going to click the next button myself. If you want to pull up, what is this, the ninth presentation? No RX, All right? Uh, that was a really great job, Arup. Um, very inspiring to see what you're doing. Um, and uh, we should definitely talk. Um, so David Franklin, David, you're here and ready to go. You're unmuted. All right, here we go. Oh, I see Dr. Kumar is here too. Hey, Tool. Welcome. One of our uh, longest standing judges and mentors and even an investor in MedStarter. 
Uh, Dr. Kumar is one of our very trusted mentors in the network. So, okay. No Thank you RX. For the introduction, Allison. Good, good to have you here. Okay, David, uh, Heather, I assume you're ready. And so David, take it away. All right, thank you. I'm David Franklin with NARX. Um, NARX is a mobile application that allows for patients and physicians to simply and efficiently manage medication treatments for better health outcomes. Patients failing to take their medications as prescribed is one of the most serious and longstanding challenges in healthcare. This is my father in the top right hand corner who I lost in 2018 while in an ICU due, due to a medication induced side effect. Today on average, a patient has 13 minutes with their physicians. In that time, 80% of the physician visits results in a prescription. 50% of these prescriptions are not taken as prescribed and 24% of these prescriptions aren't even picked up. This is a huge problem. It results in 125 million readmissions, 110,000 patient deaths, and the cost continues to go up both for the provider and for patients. It's a human problem as well. Patients are very busy. And now with COVID, we're even more stressed out. We're confused based off the medication labels and we eventually just stay sick. Doctors as well are very busy. Their workload is 2,300 patients on average to one physician. And they can't intervene because they're not aware of what's happening. Our solution at NARX is simple. It's safe and it's secure. For patients, we provide them alerts we continuously keep them informed, we empower them, we build trust with their physician, and we provide accountability with their care, care teams. For providers, they gain insight about their patients in real life, they save time, and they reduce burnout. This equals into healthier and happier patients, reduced readmissions, and saving costs for everyone. This is an example of our product, and because of COVID, we've been able to bring in newer features that allows us to deploy individual health insights to give patients the avail availability to track, update, and engage with telehealth, their primary care, receive assessment, and then navigation into advanced care at the most appropriate time. We're very passionate about healthcare. I'm a US Navy Gulf War veteran. My co-founder, Dr. Powell, has spent 24 years in clinical research. Our market size is $350 billion and where our target audience is 28 to 58 females, 58-year-old uh, females. Our business model is a, a SaaS subscription model based off the cohort size and monthly fees, and we target provider network, health institutions, and contract research organizations. We have competitors in the space, and we differentiate ourselves through incentivizing accountability and rewards. These are some of our rewards and our current ask is $500,000 for continued pilots and paying customers. Thank you for your time today. That was great, thank you. Okay, David, I, I'm still confused about what you guys do. I mean, I'm on the website, I'm reading this, I see that. So it's medication adherence essentially through an app, right? Medication adherence that drives down readmissions and most recently, so that's the medication management, but with COVID, we've- But how does it know that I'm taking my meds? I mean, it's just all self-entered? It's self-entered, but we also deploy accountability. So as some of our competitors have Bluetooth technology, they have video recording, we rely on accountability. So if you miss your medication, then your wife, uh, a spouse, a loved one, somebody's notified that would reach out to you. But how do they know that I missed my meds? Something pops up on my phone and I say, yes, I took it? Yeah, in case you don't take it, then that notification is sent out. David, Atisha here. Um, I, I have a question. I mean, my grandma has Parkinson's and after, I mean, she's 85. Um, and there were many times that I would stop by during lunch and make sure she took it. Or sometimes on the phone, she would say yes with older patients and dementia and whatnot. Can you walk me through a use case? Because I'm with Alex on the confusion. Yeah. And, um, so likewise, my mother uh, lives with me. She has Parkinson's, she's 78 years old. Uh, and right now she's interacting through Alexa. We have voice alerts and Alexa can update like other uh, wearable or Bluetooth devices can update the system. Our target audience are 28 to 58 year olds, not seniors who are statistically on more medications. Um, but as the 50 year olds move north, 
they're already digital and, and can move that way in, in that direction and uh, have adoption of the tool. So I'm sorry, real quick follow up. I mean, what's the difference between me just setting an alarm? I have an alarm on my phone to take my vitamins every morning. So, you know, I. Correct. So what we're doing here is uh, empowering the patient. There are applications out there that already have scheduling. So we're beyond mm -hmm. scheduling in that we personalize the medication. Uh, we can do this through our genomics partnership. We can do this through our um, incentive program through nutritional uh, wellness. So as your medication changes, your nutritional plan changes. We also digitize the pharmacy label. Uh, most often that people throw away and even though they may have a side effect, they don't know it's related to the medication they're on. So we run back in algorithms uh, in a machine learning, push that back out, educate the patient about the medication they're on. Um, from drug to drug, drug to food interactions, warnings, side effects as well. Got it. That was helpful. Thank you. David, this is Pamela. I am not going to take metformin anymore because of the side effects. It makes me sick. I have a friend who's schizophrenic who is not going to take her medication anymore because of low libido. Pam, get, to, yeah, low get libido. to your question, please. Pam. <laughs> so my question is, how are you going to address those issues? People don't, are non-compliant for lots of reasons. And setting an alarm is just going to make me throw it across the room. Okay. Well, this where, yeah, this is where it comes down to patient education. There are clinical trials that have indicated that nudge technology will increase inheritance uh, six times, but it's through patient education and understanding why you need to take something and improving that engagement and trust back with your physician. And then understanding more from a genomic standpoint that one pill doesn't fit all and what do you really need as a patient uh, from a medication standpoint or from a holistic uh, point of view to help complement uh, or to to help address any situations you're going through. David, this is Atul Kumar. A question, how many users do you, how many patients do you have and what's your business model? So right, last question. Okay, I heard the bell. Uh, the business model, uh, we sell to providers. It's a SaaS uh, subscription model. So they play a monthly fee based off the co cohort size mm -hmm. that they want to monitor. Uh, so it's, uh, a provider, it's health institutions, it's contract research organizations. Uh, we are early stage, we completed our MVP um, and we're scheduling pilots to move into not just for the medication management, but relative to COVID around our individual health insights. Do you have any patients or any practices? Oh, last question, last question. It's okay, it was, it was, it was part of the question. Can we cut him some slack? Oh, okay, all right. No, we're, we're, we're actually in, uh, moving into pilots from our MVP right now. Thank you, David. Okay, great. And I will, I will say to the judges, uh, you know, please take turns if, if, uh, if you know, somebody hasn't spoken in a while, you know, to let them have a chance. <clears throat> Not going to name any names. Um, okay, so, <laughs> so this gets us, I believe, to our 10th presentation. Is that right? Uh, so if judges, you'll fill out your forms on... Sum up the scalability. I think this is pretty scalable. Don't let me influence you though. Presentation quality. I, okay, we got that one there. Okay, so I am done. Um, okay, so then we got James Cowan from uh, uh, Dosicity. Uh, James, is, is Jocelyn with you, Jocelyn Cowan, or is that a different Cowan? I don't know Jocelyn. She sounds great though. <laughs> Yeah, well, my sister's actually Jocelyn, but different Jocelyn. Um, but uh, anyway, no, so there's a Jocelyn who's been reaching out to us. She's also entered into the challenge with the oh. last name as you. Um, cool. Yeah, I guess. I, the same for, yeah, last name. Never mind. Um, okay, so judges, you guys are ready. Uh, this is our 10th, uh, so try to keep up. And even if you just got here, you can go through the judging form, or even just later you can text me your top three teams or what have you and the ones you've seen. Um, I'd like to have full data sets, but you know, I'll take what I can get, uh, especially for those of you who just got here. But if you go through the judging form, which Pat, have you, have you been posting <clears throat> in the chat box every five minutes as usual? Uh, if you haven't, please post it again now. Um, you can just skip ahead to wherever, you know, 
you are in the application or in the event. So we're now on Docicity, which is, you know, the 11th section or the 10th company pitching. And, uh, you know, we're excited to see you guys building the grid for healthcare. So, uh, so if Heather, you're ready. Um, and if uh, James, you're ready. Uh, yep. I will shut up and let you talk. All right. Uh, well, first of all, everybody, thanks for having Docity Health uh, with you tonight. My name is James Cowan. I'm the founder, along with me is Will Bewley, who's on the call. Um, Docity exists to create a grid for healthcare, and similar to the way we have an electrical grid. We build that by bundling telehealth as an on-bill line item subscription service through partnerships with internet service providers. We didn't start that way, though. We've actually launched our product. We're currently inside of uh, 12 different clinics with close to 7,000 patients. Uh, we started our service by partnering with clinics uh, in the HIV and infectious disease space, as well as from four other specialties, including primary care and urgent care. Um, we have integrations that allow us to also uh, use a attachable USB otoscope. Our very first partnership actually came a couple of years ago with Chattanooga EPB, which is a, a broadband provider in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, where they tested uh, a program that, uh, that allowed their customers to sign up for access to healthcare providers from their local community over a software-defined network or VPLS circuit, which is essentially a private HOV lane for healthcare. Um, we're targeting the small and mid-sized internet service providers across the country. There's 400 community broadband providers that make up 37% of the country and 25 million households. Uh, we have already made traction in, in light of the FCC's funding, which was just released, $200 million targeting uh, broadband partners in rural communities. We are now activating those partnerships for the clinics and hospitals in those areas. Because we partner with ISPs, we have a low cost of acquisition. They do all of our marketing. We simply provide them the collateral and we share in the subscription revenue with them. Um, we are at the close of our initial seed round of funding of $500,000. We have $50,000 left. We are looking for introductions to clinics, hospitals, and internet service providers, in particular in mid-sized cities and smaller. Um, there are a lot of potential acquirers. Um, of course, that will all depend on how well we do in establishing a dominant position in these mid-sized and smaller markets our ability to develop intellectual property for software-defined networking, um, and then recurring revenue models across multiple lines, starting first in telehealth, but of course, we're moving into remote patient monitoring and chronic care management as well. Here's a couple of screenshots of our software from the sign-up process where people tell us how they found us, to their dashboard where they create appointments, future development uh, is our internal dashboard where we can observe total visits, and then map those back to our very own grid. And this is the in session where you can see call details, patient history, and of course, send a prescription to the pharmacy. We are SureScript certified and HIPAA compliant in every way. We're also on the mobile stores for both Apple and, uh, and Android. And uh, we would love to work with anybody on this call who's excited about developing a telehealth partnership that extends healthcare the communities that need it most in a way that's never been attempted by any other telehealth company. That's great. Thank you. That's three minutes. I actually have a question. How yeah. is this different from uh, ZocDoc or is ZocDoc not into the smaller communities? So ZocDoc can be in the smaller communities. The challenge with these communities, of course, is uh, there are no sales reps that reach out to um, uh, places like Anza, California or Cassopolis, Michigan but there's seven to 12,000 households there that seek care 45 minutes from where they live. So we're different in a number of ways from ZocDoc. Uh, the biggest one is the way that we go to market in that partnership with the ISP. No, one's, no one else is doing that. Um, we're also different in that we, uh, we're looking to create uh, something that goes deeper than just the telehealth connection. We actually are trying to enable local providers for remote patient monitoring and chronic management. Right. Yeah, it's definitely a unique go-to-market strategy. Um, James, Cassopolis, really? I've actually been to Cassopolis. Why did you mention Cassopolis? Because uh, we're working with Midwest Energy, which is the local co-op electric and internet utility there. Uh, Bob Hans is their CEO. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy that you've been there. The, the odds of that are, are statistically insignificant. Alex has been everywhere. 
Yeah, I will. That was nice, nice job. I'm curious if you comment a little bit more about your business model. Yeah. So we have two subscription-based models that we utilize. One is a fully bundled model uh, where they can pay for unlimited access for a year for them and any member of their household under the age of 18. Uh, we price that typically north of $20 per month. We also have a lower subscription model where they can actually just pay cash for each visit and we have a lower amount that gets added to their bill. Uh, that's used uh, depending on the market. Uh, and sometimes we offer it um, in our two existing ISP model markets, uh, we're offering both. It's all, uh, Sherrod, you guys got questions? Not to pick on the male uh, Indian physicians here, but you guys haven't talked that much. Yeah, you know, I, I do have a question. This is a tool, um, a tool, Kumar. Um, so what is the potential opportunity um, and how big of a um, deal or revenue model could, is this for the ISPs? And is this only limited to the small towns? I mean, or would you be going to Fios and Comcast, if I understand correctly? I mean, they would be potential also, but would it be, you know, something that would interest or pique them? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question, Atul. So the answer is no, we're not limited to small markets. We entered those markets um, kind of because we, we found CEOs of, of rural ISPs extremely eager to offer the product um, to the people who live in their communities. We have had conversations in the past with Verizon, Cox, uh, and other larger cable and internet service providers, and they're very interested. In fact, Cox made a telehealth logistics acquisition about four years ago. They don't have a platform they're currently offering at scale though. In terms of the market size, if you wanna just use $20 a month um, at a penetration rate uh, of a few percent across the, the folks who live in these communities that are small, mid-sized and smaller, uh, that in and of itself is a $6 billion market opportunity. So what does the $20 get me? Well, if you're, on a large, if you're on a plan that costs you that much, it's going to get you and your family unlimited access to the providers that are a part of that local network delivering care. Interesting. Okay. And those would be televisits, correct? That is correct. Yep. Synchronous face-to-face. -face. What's, uh, what's in it for, the, uh, for the, your partner, <coughs> the players? Well, depending on which partner you're referencing, if it's an ISP, they're going to get an additional ARPU, average revenue per user, on a month-to-month -month basis while offering an innovative product that their competitors don't. If it's the hospital or clinic, not only do they get a little bit of additional revenue from participating in the program, they also get the downstream revenue from capturing those households who they may not otherwise get a, get a chance at. So this is Betty. How is the doctor actually interacting on telehealth medicine if they aren't necessarily signed up with your app? Um, so when we go into a market, we do a quick search, obviously using our own resources in the MPI registry. We first go to larger uh, clinic chains and hospitals and urgent care as we work our way down from there. So if, if, uh, if, a, if Cassopolis, Midwest Energy and Communications said they wanna go, what we then do is get the list of, of hospitals in that community and then we reach out to and recruit them. We have the added benefit of having the people who deliver their internet potentially reach out to them and say, do you want to uh, serve these 7,000 households? So there's an assumption about connectivity. Um, we, we, we try, we work really hard not to assume anything, but obviously the, the, we, we are able to assume connectivity by working directly with the broadband partner. It does three minutes. Thank you. May I? Oh, we're done. Okay. Um, well, so we're now, uh, at the end of the presentations. So if people could, um, finish up their scoring, um, Pam, if you have a question, you could, uh, send it in the uh, chat box to them directly. Um, thanks everybody for being part of this. Great job, James. Um, and uh, we can talk about uh, Cassopolis some other time. The, um, <laughs> yeah. I do, we do actually have a couple of um, folks who asked if they could talk a little bit. Um, but I don't know if Aline, if you're ready, if you've got a, if you've got a panel discussion that you want to do. So if we do let these exhibition folks, um, you know, talk for a minute each, um, you know, it's up to you guys. I mean, I'm just going to be working on the data, uh, and I, both of them are doing very interesting things, um, which uh, this what we're doing here, right? It's a platform for everybody to hear about these cool things. If you want to get involved with them, yeah, that's what the forums are for, and you know the forums are for. Um, so what do you guys think? Just show up thumbs, thumbs up, thumbs down on 
two more presentations. I know you're going to say Candace because you're one of them. <laughs> okay, so go, we got from William. <laughs> Paulo's got to go. Got to go. Sorry. A tool, Sherrod. What do you guys think? Okay, I got a thumbs up. Okay, so Pat, Pat, do you have Candace's uh, yeah, Candace's deck handy? Okay, so now there's no judging thing for this. Um, it's not part of the competition. Everybody, of course, can go get loaded up on medsoda.com and we're going to be promoting the heck out of that once a couple of companies are in there. Um, and so we invite everybody because honestly, we had, you know, hundreds of applications and, you know, only 40 slots for pitching. Um, so there's, you know, there's only so many that we can actually get on, get on stage. As you can imagine, it's a little bit of a production to run these events. So, um, so we can't do them every single day. Um, like we might like to, maybe we'll do that some week, but not this week. Now that we've gotten so good at it. Okay, so do you have Candace's deck, uh, Pat? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. I didn't realize it. I can also share. I think. Am I sharing right now? Um, there's, I think we're probably on Pat's. Remember, you only have a minute, so just try to be quick about it. And then, Pat, did you okay. find Chance in the uh, in the audience? Pat, are you sharing? Uh, no, you are. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, I only have a minute. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, so um, at Sharp Turn Institute, we address social issues related to medical crises. Um, we de developed Sharp Turn Institute, my sister and I, I'm a, Julia wrote the book, um, A Sharp Turn. And um, from her book, we are bringing her lessons to a broader audience. We both have a neurological disease that made it so that we could no longer work our full-time jobs. And um, her, the lessons that she teaches in her book helped us to thrive and we wanted to help other people to thrive. So um, we want to expand because COVID-19 brings up many dilemmas for people with serious medical conditions, like this doorknob. The person with a balance issue will think, how am I going to get through that door? I can't use the doorknob for balance without covering with a wipe, but I can't get the wipe without using the doorknob for balance. So this leaves us very fearful and frustrated and even more isolated. The groups that we run help people in a creative way in a joy, with joy and humor to address these problems. And we've been helping people in the past, we are we help people now and we'll be able to help even more people post COVID-19. Um, and so I'm just going to skip ahead because we get asked by a lot of people to help them with um, understanding serious medical conditions and how to support people going through the process. And our um, approach is unique because it's uh, like ties a lot of things together and is individualized. In every session we practice, we reflect, and during the course we demonstrate that our participants can have their own skills and resources to build a powerful support network. Um, there's lots of research that shows that this is effective. We've done our research, we've done lots of um, pre-evaluation, uh, post-evaluation, of the classes and during the class we um, evaluate. We have people fill out forms after each class to see which portion was most helpful. Um, so emotional health strongly impacts the effectiveness of medical in, um, interventions and that's what we do at Sharp Turn Institute. So we want help with um, We really want help making more connections so that people will take advantage of our classes um, and help us do more documentation of how this is helping people so that we can, uh, I can't think of the model, but where you, like a health team or a health agency would say, people who are recently diagnosed with MS or like we have ataxia we recommend you take this class and then the healthcare um, partner like Meritor or Mount Sinai would help pay for that so that the cost wouldn't be from the patient. 
seeking connections and financial assistance to promote this class. That's it. And my sister should was online, but um, I'm on now. Oh, there she is. I can, can you guys hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, Julia. Yes, to answer questions? Yes, we can hear you, but we actually okay. didn't have time for Q&A. But um, if anybody you. has a question, please ask now. Have you thought about getting a Medicare code so that people could be reimbursed and not pay for the class themselves? Uh, there is in fact, and um, we decided to spend some time on other things presentation but we don't like the idea of our any of our purchase sell big contracts to big medical systems like Candace just mentioned that patient like Mount Sinai in New York and Meritor and Madison Cincinnati. Okay. It, so it, but it would be something like an occupational therapist could code that or a nurse could code that as a support group. Yeah, there would be a, a code for it. Our life skills reimbursement. Thanks. And then you could get paid. Pardon? And then you could get paid. Yeah, getting paid is good. <laughs> okay, great. So um, thank you. Uh, so we actually have uh, a guy that I just met today, and now this is unusual, but I'm pretty excited about what he had to say. Um, and we do have a minute here. So um, if you, you want to, thank you for, for, for talking, Candace. So Chance, you have a chance, no pun, okay, small pun intended, um, <laughs> to tell us a little bit about what you're doing. You got a minute, and if we could give him the screen as opposed to uh, continuing with this shared. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I will try to be very brief. Uh, and thank you. For can you, can you stop sharing? Hang on, Chance. Hang on. Thank you. Okay, so spotlight Chance and let's go. Go ahead, Chance. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to take a brief minute uh, to talk about what we're trying to do here. Uh, I do, I can share a website, but I, I gave you the link anyway. It's COVID, uh, COVID 19 vent. Dot com. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is rapidly uh, assemble uh, medical grade ventilators using a crowdsourcing type of model where we have uh, 3D printers around the country who are printing parts. Uh, the, the ventilator itself was designed by an engineer uh, with background out of uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, where I was a professor, I knew this this young man then. He pulled together a lot of people, also helped him do that. Um, and we are moving very quickly. We've printed parts from networks all over the country, including here, down in Alabama, here being Texas, where I am, down in Alabama. Uh, we even have some people over in India looking at the printing parts. Fuji, America's involved with us. Autodesk is involved with us, uh, and we have some foundations who have supported. Um, but what we're really trying to do is ramp up very quickly, um, produce these ventilators very quickly, uh, get FDA approval before we widely um, uh, distribute. And um, we just need help and we need eyes on this. Uh, we, Fuji, one of the things Fuji did was help us activate a network of uh, 3D printers. Uh, one set in Chicago, another in Boston, uh, one actually down here in the Texas area to print parts and send them into our central hub in Rochester. And, and uh, if you follow also on the uh, Facebook and Twitter, you'll see some of the pieces come together. We're trying to do this thing uh, and get this next week to have a model, a prototype re ready to roll and a process to produce many, many, many of them shortly after that. Um, if you like, I could share the website, but I think you all would be able to go there on your own. So I won't take up 
that talk. Great, thanks, Chance. Um, hey, hey, Alex, can we just can I just ask one question? Just what what could we do to help that help his efforts? Um, I think the thing is, if there are see, so there's three D printed parts, and then there's source parts. There's uh, you know control boards, uh, even the 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 uh, <clears throat> the part that's inside actually is an automotive part. So we try to source these parts from places that are not medical sourcing uh, locations so that we don't mess up the supply chain. So I guess the question, answer the question would be um, <clears throat> anything that, you know, you could bring to the table with regard to maybe manufacturing and distribution. Um, of course, obviously, uh, some monetary support would be helpful as we do the development People are giving their time and effort to do it. Um, and, and as we try to make many, many more of these, um, but then just spreading the word about it and uh, helping us add to whatever else anyone else is doing in this. I think if the wrong decisions are made, you know, in the country and even globally, we'll see more cases of this start to pop back up. So anyway, um, anything you can think of to help is okay. would be... Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you, Chance. Yeah, thank we'll you back. for letting me do this. It was, that was no, it's, it's, that was we're something. inspired by your ingenuity and, and drive, uh, and it's exciting. And I, you know, I mean, I think this kind of opens up to what I think we might want to talk about in the panel. Um, so I, I can let Aline take that away if she's still awake. Um, Aline, are you still here? We can take the yeah, spotlight yeah. off, Chance. I Let's put the spotlight on Aline. Aline, can you lead the a discussion uh, uh, on whatever you want to talk about here? I'm doing the math. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Aline. So I was actually curious to 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 hear from all of you. So we've been confined. So here in Spain, it's been we are it's been five weeks tomorrow that we're at home. So everybody has to work from home. And for, for the people like well like uh, freelancers, maybe it's easier than for others working for big companies and they have to adjust to that. Some people are maybe not too used to or to do like working remotely. And so I'm curious to hear from all of you if you have tips. What have you learned those past weeks? What works for you? What did you put in place to adapt to that new uh, situation? Anyone want to share? I can take this away. <laughs> um, so I've actually been working from home since uh, March 9th. And that was my last day at work. Um, I, I haven't really felt what everyone else has been feeling till I want to say this week. Um, just like this whole foggy, um, foggy brain feeling like what day is it? What hour is it? Was it yesterday or today that I sent that email out? And I think um, I was so on schedule for the first like three, four weeks when I fell off schedule. And I think a lot of it has to do with just having a plan. Um, Cause you know, before we were, we had a plan when we had to leave our houses at a certain time to make it to work at a certain time. Now we don't. Um, and I think really having that schedule and me, I, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest, I fell off of that, off of that schedule. And that was probably the most helpful was just being disciplined. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I thought I was losing my mind when I couldn't figure out what day it was. Like, I couldn't believe it was Thursday already. Like, I, I don't think of the day or the time. I mean, I've been gauging myself by what time Donald Trump gives his speech in the evening. I mean, is that sad? I mean, I think it's sad. But that's how I gauge what day it is. I'm sad. <laughs> sad. Very sad. Yeah. Very, very sad. I can tell you what I do every day. Alex knows. <laughs> Please do. Every do. morning I meditate and uh, before I start my day, um, I actually get online and there's a guided meditation. It's a live one actually that I signed up for. And um, it's been getting me grounded and I write a gratitude list every morning. And it's definitely worked for me to kind of start my day in gratitude instead of um, jumping out of bed and 
trying to deal. So, but do you know what day it is? I do. It's this day, that day, yesterday, tomorrow. <laughs> Namaste, Diana. <laughs> Namaste. Paul, I, I, I've been working from home for a very long time, for over a decade. Much less of a disruption than people who are not used to working from home. Um, always found it's been very helpful to just have a routine and just um, maintain mental well-being as well as physical well-being. Um, and yep, practice definitely helps. Uh, connecting much more often virtually now than I used to, because obviously you can see go out and move off, off the table in the short run. But uh, clearly having a routine and meeting engage with people on a regular basis. Uh, what I find is people are much more willing to a phone when you call them now in the moment versus a lot of scheduled stuff. And it does feel like Groundhog Day um, every day. <laughs> Because if you haven't seen that movie, you should. This is kind of what we're getting the opportunity to experience. And hopefully, a, a like Bill will get it right at the end. And we'll get to move on. The opportunity to be grateful for, um, at least for me, I'm finding it's really an opportunity to kind of dig in and understand like what's really valuable and what's important and what I don't need and what other people don't need and what really matters, which is connection. So I appreciate Alex for putting this together. And sunshine. I actually sat. I'm, I'm based out of Philly again, but um, it's 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 chilly. It's cold, but I sat out, bundled up, and the sun helped. Isn't it, all, isn't it always Philly? It's always sunny in Philly. Duh. <laughs> I grew up in Philly, Atisha. I, I can poke fun at Philly. <laughs> oh my gosh, we'll have to catch. Up. We'll have to connect at some point. Oh, faux show. <laughs> Um, I, I have a particular challenge I'd like to share, if, if, if I have a few minutes. Sure. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm an uh, academic administrator. Um, I'm actually sitting in, in my office at the University of Houston, Victoria. Uh, I got the privilege of being one of the essential people, so I could actually come to the office. But it's nobody here, so it doesn't really matter. But we really have a challenge of... Uh, how do we continue to ed educate our students uh, in this situation? Uh, we are fortunate to make the decision to not bring the students back before, and we close early for spring break and not bring them back because, you know, situation, you send them out, bring them back together, spread this thing. But now, uh, like many academic institutions, the challenge is going forward. What do we do? How do we do it? Uh, how do we continue to function in this particular environment um, and everybody's uh, ha is has anxiety about this everybody the students faculty staff everybody and they don't really know what the next day necessarily is looking like and and we have to try to lead in this and uh, and you know assure people but also make decisions to keep things going so um, it, it is quite the challenge, and uh, any thoughts any of you have on this, I'd be more than happy. So I heard yesterday that the U.S. universities would go back uh, physically in January 2021, and that the classes would be online till then? It, it's all over the place. Each state and institution or system are making their own decisions. Uh, no one set a timetable for them coming back. Certainly the summer, the fall is, is more than likely out unless a miracle happens. Uh, we've been fortunate in that we, we've always had a strong online posture. So all of our programs are available online. So we were able to move over. But, you know, it, it's, it's still been difficult because a lot of students are just not used to it. And some faculty are not used to it. And so we had to make that transition, but other institutions are really struggling. And, uh, and then on top of that, the, the state budgets are being hit because of the dollars that are being lost. And it just so happens in Texas, we were already being hit because of the oil prices and, and that whole uh, issue that was going on. With mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit of a mess and uh, I, don't, I don't know what's gonna happen uh, in, in the near future. Can someone share experiences, maybe from other states in the in the U.S., of how the situation is being handled? 
Yo, right, okay. now, right now it's chaos. Like everybody's <laughs> trying to figure it out. It's just so much uncertainty. And you're going to get a, a ridiculous range of answers across every segment of uh, human, human existence and experience. It really depends on who you're talking to. In the, it's like live triage with new data coming in consistently. Everybody's trying to diagnose what's going on and decide what to do. And I, right, it, frankly, I, I go down the honest path, just kind of be in the mall. Do what you can do in your space and don't spend a lot of time thinking about things you can't affect and do your best and not let it cause you suffering. It's going to change. We have very, very few answers now and a shitload of questions and uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. I actually like the online courses because I can go at my own pace, mm. which is faster than sitting in a classroom listening to a lecture. Yeah, there, there is a benefit to that if, if that's your thing, uh, you know. That's my thing. You, you'll hear others who say, oh, I love being in the classroom. Maybe I like to see it. I like to be able to immediately get feedback and all that. So we have all those type, not only the students, but the faculty and staff as well. And so, you know, it, 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 it's, it's all across the board there. But we, you know, we, what I'm really uh, encouraged by are two things. One is the adaptability that we have as human beings and two is the goodness I'm seeing in people now I know there's a lot of stories about bad things people are doing but there's a ton of things of good things that people are doing for each other and that is just extremely encouraging to see across the board so I agree it doesn't sell as much it doesn't sell as much and give as much attention what the good things are as the bad things yeah, There's way yeah. more good going on right now. People are just totally stepping it up. And yeah. honestly, people have learned and we know that by doing for others, yeah. experience great joy, right? And that's one of the best things we can do for our mental well to get us out of this horrifying lack of certainty <laughs> suffering moment is how do we give to others? And helping others is by far one of the best antidotes for just the stress and just we're experiencing because of the unknown. Yeah. Uh, you know what's really bad about this? One of the impulses we have when there's tough situations is to try to come together and be together. But this that's one of the main things you can't do in this situation. Is, is You know, on the point of education that you made, you know, I think the flip the classroom model was sort of getting popular. And there is, I think, virtue to watching, you know, um, the lectures online so that it can be done at your pace and oh. you breaking up at all at all i think we lost you too you can repeat it but i think there is necessarily a good substitute for that. you know people need yeah I'm, I'm sorry i'm just having trouble with my internet uh, but I, I, the point I was making is there is no substitute for people coming together to solve problems. Mm. You just need to. That needs to happen. People need to do the homework together. And that flip the classroom is a wonderful model. And I think we'll adopt and we'll see more of that. And maybe it will hasten that sort of flip the classroom model, mm. the adoption of that. And I think in healthcare, I think we'll see adoption of new technologies. So maybe this mm -hmm. will all end on a good note. Yeah. I think there's going to be an opportunity for us to learn how to be virtual more effectively and yes. we'll slip in and out of real life and virtual mm. and yeah. real life and virtual back and forth much more mostly because we're just going to become used to it. But this is going to be a long slog. Yeah. yeah. You know, Max Planck once said, you know, science advances one generation at a time. Mm. But, you know, this has actually forced us, you know, to move along, to make that generational change, you yeah. know, there are people that wouldn't have sort of made a move on technology that have no choice now, and they will, and I think it'll all be good. Yeah, yeah. good Max Planck didn't live in the era of digital and AI and all the other emerging tech that allows you to change in the moment. Yeah, we, the acceleration of technology is exponential. Is, you know, because if you think about it, it's in the past 50 years uh, what, what has changed, and, but if you go back centuries and centuries there were t there has been hundreds not even thousands of years where technology really didn't change that much 
and then in the 20th, 20th and 21st century, just started accelerating up the curve. Uh, so we're, you know, it's, it, but you're right, this is forcing us to do some things we wouldn't normally do. We're going to figure it out because that's what, that's what human beings do. And, uh, we, you know, for a lot of this, we may end up being better for it. Yeah, there's a, a lot to be grateful for. And um, nothing sharp in this in the mind like the protection in the morning, they said. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You know, so no, one of the things about being on the, you know, uh, on, uh, on the panel like this is to get to see all the things that are going on. And, you know, one thing we have to really be aware of that everything, I mean, the last 50 years were amazing, but everything that happened in the last 50 years is going to be replicated in the next 10 years. Just imagine that. And I think we just have to be ready and prescient, you know, in regards to that change that is expected. Everything that happened in the last 50 years, all that change change is going to happen in the next 10 years. Yeah, it's definitely accelerating. Okay, so does anybody want to hear who won? Sure. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I mean, if you guys want to keep talking, don't let me stop you. But, um, this is what it's all about. We're, we're all winners. Uh, I'm interested in hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Show me the money. Show me here's the money. my, here's my, here's my uh, input. Oh, look at her, so cute. You asked, you asked how life has changed for us. So I have five kids. Oh, wave, 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 Rowan. God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm now running the company from home, helping with education and uh, and all that. So thank for uh, changing. <laughs> yeah. That's great. We remember those days well. Now mm. I'm actually totally isolated now since I managed to get myself COVID last week. And so my kids can't visit, so. Did we'll you get the test? Yeah. Um, we're working on it. Are you supposed to be like ordering them, Deanna? <laughs> anyway. Show me the money. Show me the money. That's, so in order to get tests, so we're talking about like buying 10,000 tests and like setting up a, a place to just let the public come and test. Um, just another, another great idea from, uh, our innovation community. That's actually Dr. Kumar's idea who's uh, who's on the on the line today. So are you serious? We're serious. Serious like artifact. The uh, we actually we've got a, a uh, airstream all picked out and we're picking out the test. Yeah, and, I like that uh, airstream. Yes. Do you like the airstream? It's pretty cool. Yeah. It reminds cool. me of uh, do you remember did you ever read Tom Robbins, even cowgirls get the blues? No, it's it's not, it's he it's travels not. around the country in a giant silver airstream anyway it's really it's like a 60s hippie kind of book mm -hmm. anyway um so I, I, so yeah that might be driving in from vegas they asked if we wanted so maybe i don't know we'll see if the fire department will uh, do crowd control for us um anyway so so yes okay so we're supposed to be talking about who won um so lots of judging uh thank you everybody for your input um so we, you know, uh, basically just averaging the scores, looking at it with the official judges, with the non-official judges, you know, looking for outliers, normalizing, whatever. So um, so it all comes out the same way. So using crowd judges or just the, the expert judges or whatever. So I guess we all agree. So uh, third place um, was uh, the company that sort of inspired a lot of this was uh, uh, Tal's uh, Israeli-based uh, virus track which uh, I think is amazing potential, but, um, but you guys win the, what we call the crowd choice. So I don't know what we're gonna do with this, but uh, as you know, Tal, we keep on talking to you and, and we'll probably do something at some point with you. Uh, but at the very least, we wanna see you up on medcenter.com, <laughs> put, put you on the homepage um, for that. Uh, second place, um, I'm glad you stayed around, Neil. I think you're still here. Um, but oh, was I'm the, here. Great, so Eminante. Uh, came in second, so a great job. That means you're going to be making the uh, the finals next week. Excellent. Um, and uh, where we're going to do this all over again, so just with the top two teams in every category. Um, and then, you know, drum roll, please. Uh, our uh, first place out of San Francisco, uh, Elemento. Uh, I want to say P. I, I don't know if that's what. <laughs> <laughs> no? 
there's like a song with that. It's like a little kid song. <laughs> you know, anyway, so uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Berman or Roy Berman. Um, Arup, are you still here, Arup? Or did you go back to uh, treating patients or something? I guess I'm he, well, that's what happens when we talk too long. So we will be informing him, publishing this, sending it out to everybody. And of course, um, uh, we'll be seeing him again next week in the, uh, in the finals. So I don't know if we're going to continue doing this next month after we do these finals. We'll see how it goes on the uh, MedSider.com uh, platform with the, uh, the online showcase. But uh, the response from this has been overwhelming. You guys being involved, all the judges, everybody, it's been fantastic. Pat, especially you, Heather, thank you uh, for everything you guys have been doing. Uh, we could do nothing without a giant crowd of people being involved and supported, supporting. So Pat, what was our, what did we max out today at our audience? Uh, I think we're around 50-ish top. It's respectable. You know, the problem with doing this every week is I think that people get like virtual event fatigue, um, but, uh, but it's, it's always interesting. Other websites though. And what's happening on, uh, on the views on YouTube and such and Facebook? Do we have stats on that? Uh, I can look it up. Well, I know the MedSoda.tv uh, page has been getting a lot of hits. Um, but yeah, well, we should have more math on that later. Anyway, thank you everybody for joining. Um, this will all be available live and later on MedStarter.tv as always. And we'll see you same time next week if you guys want to come back.